A 64-year-old man is behind bars for setting fire to his special needs wife inside their home. At 7.39pm on Tuesday the 24th of October, authorities responded to a call about a patient being treated for severe burns at Phoebe Putney Hospital in Albany, Georgia. When officers arrived, they learned that emergency medical personnel had picked up 67-year-old Amanda Jenkins earlier that day from her residence in the 400 block of Bobbitt Drive. Medics said Amanda was unresponsive and suffered burns to about 25% of her lower body. Police then responded to the victim's home and made contact with her husband, 64-year-old Henry Hardwick. When questioned by police, he said he was rubbing alcohol on his wife because she was in a great deal of pain from a condition of multiple sclerosis two days earlier. While applying the alcohol to his wife's skin, he lit a cigarette too close to her, causing her body to catch fire. Instead of seeking immediate help, Henry told police he panicked and was too scared to call for help. He said he waited two days before calling Amanda's daughter. He came to their home and saw that her mother was in dire need of medical attention and called 911. Due to the severity of the injuries, she was taken to the Augusta Burn Unit for specialised treatment. On Wednesday the 25th of October, Henry was arrested and charged with aggravated assault and is held at the Doherty County Jail without bond. Authorities said that further charges are expected. This isn't Henry's first run-in with the law. In April, he was charged with simple battery, domestic trespass, and obstructing or hindering persons making an emergency telephone call. He was released on bond on the 12th of April on the condition that he stay away from Amanda Jenkins, who was a victim. On the 5th of May, he pleaded guilty to all three charges. However, it's unclear what penalties he faced. The investigation into the matter continues. On Thursday the 26th of October 2023, 23-year-old Daniel Gunnison was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison for killing his 21-year-old girlfriend Catherine Pham with an ice axe. On the 30th of August 2023, he was found guilty of first-degree murder with the use of a deadly weapon and abuse of a corpse. At 10.58am on the 18th of May 2021, authorities responded to the 900 block of Skylark Avenue in Ridgecrest, California and found Catherine with trauma to her body. Officials pronounced her dead at the scene, and Daniel was consequently arrested. Authorities said that Daniel and Catherine were in a relationship for about a month prior to the killing. On the 17th of May 2021, Daniel displayed animosity towards Catherine, and expressed what his friends believed to be suicidal behaviour. Daniel reversed his car into a wall outside Catherine's apartment building multiple times, because he was angry she did not reciprocate his feelings. One friend recalled an incident where Daniel drove erratically at high speeds while Catherine was on the phone not paying attention to him. On the 18th of May 2021, he went to his stepfather's house and spoke about his failing relationship with Catherine. He called Catherine, expressing remorse and apologised for his behaviour. He then asked to meet up with her. He then picked her up at her apartment and drove back to his stepfather's home. When they got to the house, they both went into an RV garage. Painters working at the stepfather's house heard Catherine screaming, followed by sounds of things being moved around. The painters went into the garage about an hour later and discovered Daniel with blood all over his body and Catherine deceased on the mattress topper. She was partially naked, with her chest and midsection exposed. The painters went to the stepfather for help and called 911. Investigators determined that Daniel put on gloves, then attacked Catherine with a 24-inch axe 10 times, hitting her in the head, neck and face. After she died, Daniel repositioned Catherine's body, removed some of the clothes and proceeded to make sexual contact with her remains. Her father Tom Pham said at the time, Our only consolation would be for justice to be served so Katie could rest easy, and Ridgecrest as a community could rest easy with her. On Friday the 27th of October 2023, 43-year-old Candace Jones was found guilty of murder in her role of killing 20-year-old Michael Armanderas in 2018. She was also found guilty of armed robbery with a firearm. Candace is one of three suspects arrested and charged in connection to the murder. On the 29th of September 2023, her son and co-defendant 27-year-old Ernest Collins was convicted of murder and armed robbery with a firearm. The third suspect, Ernest's girlfriend, 26-year-old Cassandra Green, entered an agreed guilty plea to one count of armed robbery with a firearm on the 19th of August 2022 in exchange for her cooperation and testimony. On the 18th of January 2018, authorities responded to an apartment along the 100 block of South Whispering Hills Drive in Naperville, Illinois after Michael was reported missing. He was last seen four days earlier at around 9.30pm. Authorities discovered that Candace had plotted a scheme with the two other suspects to rob the victim with a gun 
after she saw social media posts in which Michael posed with cash and drugs. At 9.11pm on the 14th of January 2018, Michael received a Snapchat message from Cassandra. The two had been friends for 10 years. She told him that she was waiting outside and they were going to drive to Walmart to steal a bottle of alcohol. After receiving that message, Michael left his apartment and got into the front passenger side of a black 1999 Ford Explorer SUV driven by Cassandra. Several minutes later, Ernest came out of hiding under a blanket in the back of a vehicle and fatally shot Michael twice in the back of the head. They covered Michael's body with a blanket and drove to Candace's home in the 6800 block of South Artesian Avenue in the Market Park neighborhood of Chicago. They took Michael's body out of the car, went through his pockets taking his wallet, vape pen, keys and phone. They then stuffed Michael's body into a blue recycling bin in Candace's garage. They then used Michael's keys to burglarize his apartment the next day. The recycling bin was later moved to a garage of a vacant house next door, where Michael's decomposing body was later found. Within weeks of the murder, all three suspects were taken into custody after detectives found Michael's blood inside the Ford Explorer, and remnants of Michael's belongings were discovered in a fire pit in Candace's backyard. Candace is due in court on the 18th of December, and faces up to 75 years in prison. Ernest will return to court on the 29th of November, and faces up to life in prison. Cassandra is due in court on the 13th of November and will be sentenced to 21 years behind bars as part of a plea deal. Authorities are searching for those responsible for fatally shooting 46-year-old Legius Minder Senior. At 11.16pm on Thursday the 26th of October, authorities responded to Chubby's Convenience Store at 154 West St. Joseph Street in Eastern Pennsylvania on reports of a shooting. When officers arrived, they found Legius in the vehicle of the store's parking lot suffering from a gunshot wound. Legius was transported to a local hospital, but was pronounced dead at 7.45am the next morning. Police said they're looking for a silver Chevrolet Traverse with tinted windows, which fled north on St. John's Street after the shooting. Authorities said that they suspect the Chevy SUV was occupied by more than one person. Police said they believe the victim was known to whoever was responsible for the killing. They also said they believe the victim was the intended target, and it was a targeted attack. The motive of the attack is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. A 38-year-old man who's serving prison time for the sexual exploitation of a young girl faces 15 years to life in prison for killing his 11-year-old son in 2020. On Thursday, the 26th of October 2023, Jordan Piper pleaded guilty to second-degree murder of Roman Lopez. On the 11th of January 2020, Roman's stepmother Lindsay Piper reported the boy missing from the home at 2892 Colima Street in Placerville, California, where he and his family had lived for a little over two months. Roman lived with his father and stepmother, along with seven other children aged 1 to 17 years old. Within hours of Roman being reported missing, Placerville police found his remains inside a storage bin in the basement of his home. An autopsy report shows that the boy had no obvious trauma, but he was severely malnourished and dehydrated at the time of his death. Investigators retrieved medical records for Roman and learned he weighed 61 pounds when he was 9 years old. The El Dorado County Sheriff's Office coroner determined that Roman had not been to a doctor in two years since that appointment. Authorities said that Roman suffered physical abuse for years and had been restrained by being tied and zip-tied to his bed at night. Investigators noted that the family often moved, which added to the complexity of the case. El Dorado County District Attorney Vern Pearson said in a statement, It's absolutely horrific and incomprehensible the way Roman was tortured, abused and murdered by his own father. He said that although I recognise it will never seem like enough prison time for any parent to kill their child, today I believe we secured some measure of justice for Roman Lopez. Jordan and Lindsay were initially charged with multiple criminal counts, including child abuse, poisoning and torture. On the 8th of July 2022, Lindsay was convicted of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Jordan's sentencing is scheduled for Tuesday the 21st of November. He is currently serving a 15-year federal prison term for the sexual exploitation of a child unrelated to Roman's death. A 22-year-old man is behind bars for fatally shooting a high school student. At 2.45pm on Monday the 23rd of October, authorities responded to a gravel parking lot near Moore Square in Raleigh, North Carolina on reports of a shooting. When officers arrived at the scene, they found 15-year-old Shamar Leverett in a critical condition suffering from a gunshot wound to his chest. 
and he was rushed to a local hospital. Police arrested Steve Mark Stanley on initial charges of assault with a dangerous weapon, with intent to kill inflicting serious injury in possession of a firearm by a felon. On Sunday the 29th of October, Shamar passed away in hospital after one of his lungs was removed, and the other lungs stopped working. Shamar's mother Jasmine Leverett said her son was a student at Leesville High School. She said that Shamar and Stanley did not know each other, and was shot after Stanley confronted his 12-year-old friend, and Shamar stepped in to defend him. It's unclear what the confrontation was about. Shamar's father, Tracy Montague, said that Shamar had a close call recently after being shot two weeks ago at an apartment complex. Tracy said he got his son a bulletproof vest for his protection, however Shamar left the vest at home on the day he was shot. Stephen's charges have since been upgraded to include a count of murder. He's held at the Wake County Jail without bond. Stephen has an extensive criminal history. He was released from prison in August after serving time for felony breaking and entering. He had several prior convictions for robbery, larceny and drug possession. The investigation into the matter continues. 44-year-old Michael Shane Holstead and 43-year-old Karen Tyson Joe Holstead are behind bars after their 19-year-old son's body was found behind a home they recently moved out of. At 11.37am on Sunday the 29th of October, authorities responded to a home at 296 Bradford Drive in Headland, Alabama on reports of finding a dead body on the property. When officers arrived on scene, they located a severely decomposed body inside an overturned non-working freezer they had been left in the backyard of the home. Officers said initially because of the condition of the body, they could not immediately determine its sex. Authorities said the remains have been identified as 19-year-old Logan Michael Halstead. Authorities said he's been dead since late July or early August. Logan suffered ongoing medical issues, including spina bifida which occurs when the spine does not form correctly and can result in paralysis or the inability to walk. Logan's parents Michael and Karen have been renting the house but moved away without paying rent sometime after August of 2023. The former landlord of the home then sold the house to the current owners, who discovered the body in the freezer while cleaning the newly acquired property. The new owners said they came across the freezer in the backyard, and it was too heavy to load up onto the trailer to move, so they were going to clean it out before hauling it away. When they opened it up and began moving things around, they saw a hand and immediately called 911. After moving out of the house, Michael and Karen relocated to another residence in Jack, Alabama, about 50 miles west of the home. Several hours after the body was discovered, they were taken into custody and transported back to Henry County for questioning. Michael told investigators that Logan had bowel movements in the house, so he left the room to get cleaning supplies. When he returned, he claimed his son was dead. He reportedly wrapped his son's body in blankets, a shower curtain, and a plastic bag and placed his remains into a cardboard box before putting him in the freezer. He said he moved the rest of his family, which included his twin children, out of the house following Logan's death. Michael said that he later called Headland Police to alert them that his son's remains were in the freezer weeks before it was discovered, but officers failed to find them in a previous search of the property and left. Henry County Sheriff Eric Blankenship said that Michael claimed he suffered a manic episode and didn't remember how his son's body got inside the non-working freezer. There was just a lot of discrepancies in the stories in the timelines and so forth, which kind of threw up some red flags with us that there may be, you know, something else behind this or something that, that both parties are not being truthful about. Michael and Karen were arrested and charged with abuse of a corpse, and were initially held without bond at the Henry County Jail. During a court hearing on Monday the 30th of October, Michael testified that his wife had nothing to do with disposing of their son's body. A judge set their bond at $175,000 each. Authorities said an autopsy is pending, which may lead to upgraded charges against the couple including murder. The couple's twin children are reportedly in the care of Alabama Department of Human Resources. The investigation into the matter continues. 33-year-old Michael Jones is behind bars after accidentally shooting his four-year-old son at their home. At 10.12am on the 31st of October, authorities responded to an apartment at 25 Queen Street in Cranston, Rhode Island, on report of a child that had been shot. The caller indicated that the father was responsible for the shooting. When first responders arrived, they found Michael holding his son who had a gunshot wound to his head. The boy was transported to Hasbro Children's Hospital in Providence, where he underwent emergency surgery and remains in a critical condition. Michael told investigators that he was in the second floor bedroom of the residence when he was handling a loaded handgun, which accidentally discharged, causing a bullet to travel through a wall and hit his son in an adjacent room. 
Her child's grandfather, who lives on the first floor, called 911 for medical help. During a search of the premises, investigators recovered a handgun believed to be used in the shooting. Michael's charged with assault, possession of a firearm by a prohibited person, and firing a weapon in a compact area. An additional charge of violating a suspended sentence is expected from the State Attorney General's office. Cranston Police said that Michael was convicted of felony assault and sentenced to a two-year suspended sentence and probation on the 1st of June 2022. As a convicted felon, he was barred from possessing a firearm. Police don't know yet how he came into possession of the weapon. The investigation into the matter continues. 42-year-old Tyron Lambert is behind bars for fatally shooting his wife. At just after midnight on Saturday the 28th of October, a visitor at 162 Topaz Drive in Dallas, Georgia called 911 after Tyron came to the house of his estranged wife, 37-year-old Jasmine Lambert. He forced his way inside through the back door and threatened multiple people with a gun. When he learned that someone had contacted authorities, he fled the scene before deputies arrived. Paulding County deputies filed a report and began the process of obtaining warrants for his arrest. They also placed the residents on zone patrol and put out a be on the lookout alert for Tyron and his vehicle. At 7.12am, authorities received another call from the home indicating that Tyron had returned to the premises and forced his way through the back door again. Deputies responded to the scene and heard a gunshot. As deputies made their way to the back of the home, they stopped Tyron at the side gate and apprehended him after a brief struggle. Deputies then entered the house and found Jasmine unresponsive with a gunshot wound to her head. She was transported to Wellstar Paulding Hospital, where she was pronounced dead. Tyron is charged with murder, malice murder, burglary, criminal damage to property, two counts of cruelty to children, criminal trespass, possession of a firearm during a commission of a crime, two counts of aggravated assault and obstruction. He's out of the Paulding County Jail without bond. Jasmine was a mother of two and a third grade teacher at Still Elementary School in Cobb County. Authorities said there was a temporary protective order filed against Tyron last year, but it expired. The investigation into the matter continues. 29-year-old Julio Storazak has been arrested after being caught on camera physically abusing a three-year-old son. The incident occurred at just after 9pm on Monday the 30th of October at a condominium in the 17,000 block of North Bay Road in Sunny Isles Beach, Florida. Footage of the assault on the child was captured by a neighbor's doorbell camera, which was handed in to police the next day. It showed Yulia lifting a three-year-old son with both hands and slamming him to the ground before kicking the child at least twice. She then grabs him by the face and pushes him to the ground as he attempts to get up before repeatedly kicking the boy while exiting camera view. Forty minutes later, she was seen pushing the child in the chest, causing him to fall back and hit the floor. An investigator found the child had redness on his cheek and forehead and bruises on his right forearm and left knee. The child also had scratches on his stomach and back, and he told investigators that his mother had scratched him. Yulia told police that she pushed her son because he insisted on going to the playground, and he was being difficult and uncooperative, and that he wasn't listening when she told him no. She was arrested that night and booked into the Turner Guildford Night Correctional Centre. Yulia appeared in Bond Court on Wednesday morning on the 1st of November. Speaking through a Russian interpreter, Yulia told Judge Mindy Glazer that she and her son came to Florida about a year ago to escape the war in Ukraine, and that she works as a flight attendant. She said she loves and adores her child, and apologized for her actions. Yulia said, I'm very sorry. I'm a single mother. She said that this was the only incident where she let her temper get the better of her, and that she never abused her child before. Yulia was charged with two counts of abuse, and was ordered to have no contact with her son and a bomb was set at $5,000. The child is in the care of Department of Children and Families. Later that night, Yulia bonded out of jail. When she walked out, she told reporters she loved her son, and apologized for abusing her son. I'm so sorry. I won't do this anymore, she said. 21-year-old Nathan Lance is accused of biting off a man's fingertip during a struggle at a wedding after inappropriately touching a guest. On Friday the 27th of October, authorities responded to the club at Lac La Belle in Okanomawak, Wisconsin after getting a call from someone who said a man had his fingertip bitten off. When officers arrived at the wedding venue, they located Nathan sitting on a couch with blood on his sleeve, which did not appear to be from him. There was also blood on the floor and on the table in the ballroom, as well as attendees who appeared to have been disturbed by the incident, including some who were crying. 
A witness told police the incident started after Nathan touched a female's buttocks, causing others to become upset. Nathan began to yell and became very agitated, at which point people tried to isolate him in another room. The bride and groom attempted to calm Nathan, but he soon became disruptive again. Another witness walked into the room and told Nathan to leave, but he became very aggressive and continued to be loud. Nathan then lunged at him and pinned him up against the wall. Three people restrained Nathan on the ground, but during the altercation, Nathan bit the tip of someone's finger off. An officer at the scene called the injury significant, stating that about half an inch of the finger had been bitten off, exposing the bone. The victim told authorities that Nathan was running his mouth, so grabbed Nathan around the head area. Nathan then turned toward the victim and they toppled down onto the floor. At some point, the victim's hand got into Nathan's mouth, so he bit down on the finger. Officials located the victim's fingertip and put it into a cup of ice until it could be taken to hospital. The victim said he needed 18 or 19 stitches while the surgeon attempted to reattach the tip of his finger. It's unclear if the surgery was successful. Authorities said that Nathan was very intoxicated at the wedding and had a blood alcohol content level of 0 0.210, whereas the victim was completely sober. Nathan's been charged with felony aggravated battery and disorderly conduct. His bond was set at $25,000. The investigation into the matter continues. 19-year-old Dallas Bolling is behind bars for abusing and murdering his infant son. At around 12.25pm on Friday the 27th of October, authorities responded to a home along Richland Road in Stafford County, Virginia on reports of a medical emergency. When deputies arrived on scene, they found an unresponsive three-month-old child and attempted life-saving measures until paramedics arrived. The boy was transported to a local hospital, where he was later pronounced dead. The medical examiner conducted an autopsy and ruled the child's death as a homicide stemming from inflicted physical injuries. On Saturday the 28th of October, Dallas was arrested and charged with second degree murder and felony child abuse. He is held at the Rappahannock Regional Jail without bond. Dallas worked for Stafford County Fire and Rescue. In a statement, Stafford County Fire and Rescue said the allegations do not reflect the values of the department, and Dallas has been placed on administrative leave pending the investigation. Dallas's attorney, Thaddeus Furlong, said that the baby's death was accidental, adding that his client had cooperated with law enforcement. He said that Dallas called 911 and had no intention of hurting anyone. He's 19 years old, and this is his first and only child, he said. The investigation into the matter continues. A couple have been arrested after beating, burning and starving their daughter. At around 8pm on the 16th of September, a woman leaving the bar at Trails Village in the Village Centre Circle in Las Vegas, Nevada, spotted a 13-year-old girl wandering across the parking lot outside of Albertson's grocery store. She noticed the teen appeared malnourished and had visible burn marks, cuts and scars on her. The woman then called police. When officers arrived, they spoke with the victim and noticed she had several burns on her palms and arms and multiple cuts on her hands and face. She said that she ran away from home because she was getting tired of being punished. She said her biological father passed away years ago and since then she's been punished on a regular basis for doing the wrong thing or staring. She said her mother 42-year-old Casey Lilly and stepfather 43-year-old Edward Lilly would slap her in the face for staring. She said she'd been homeschooled since she was 8 years old and does not have any friends. She also said that she does not like to be at home because it makes her sad. Child Protective Services was called to the scene, and Casey also showed up and told police that her daughter ran away a few hours earlier in the evening. Casey told police her daughter likes to steal food and eat out of the trash can, even though she's provided food at home, but she could not explain why her daughter is so thin. Casey admitted to beating the girl she caught her staring at Edward. When asked why she would react this way, she said it was because her daughter admitted to having a crush on her husband. When the detective asked her how that made her feel, she said it bothered her to have another woman staring at her man. It made her want to attack. Casey said she would say, hey, that's mine, you know. Back the fuck off, that's mine. Casey also claimed that her daughter would listen to her and Edward when they had sex. Edward told detectives that he never physically disciplined the girl, whom he described as defiant and never doing what she was told. While well, interviewed at the Southern Nevada Child Advocacy Center, the girl said she did not want to go back home with her mother and stepfather due to being smacked and punished all the time. When asked about being punished, she said that she does not like having a hand on the stove. When asked why she thought her mother may have burnt her, she said she was mad at her for staring at Edward. 
She also explained how her mother would hold her hand under hot water as punishment. The victim also told police that her stepfather would beat her as well, though he wouldn't hit her as hard as her mother. A medical exam conducted on the girl showed that she weighed 78 pounds and had finger marks on both arms, a bruise on the back of her right arm, loop marks on her back, buttocks and back of both legs, burns on both hands, cuts inside her mouth on both sides, and a bruise on her left shin. On Wednesday the 25th of October, Casey and Edward were arrested and charged with three counts of abuse, and two counts of abuse resulting in substantial bodily harm. The investigation into the matter continues. 35-year-old Veronica Elliott was arrested after leaving her 7-year-old daughter alone in a car for hours while she got drunk at a local bar. At 2.58am on Sunday the 29th of October, authorities responded to the Perfect Spot restaurant and bar, located at 1600 Flightline Boulevard in Deland, Florida, in regards to a 7-year-old girl who walked into the bar looking for a mother when patrons quickly phoned police. During the investigation, police learned that the child was left alone in an unlocked car for hours, which was turned off in a dark parking lot with no lights, near other cars where people were sleeping and drinking alcohol. An officer stayed with the child while the officers looked for Veronica. At around 6.30am, as officers continued searching for Veronica, she walked up to one of them, asking what time it was. She was drunk, covered in dirt and swaying back and forth with a slurred speech and was missing her shoes. She was surprised at the time and told officers she was only meant to be away for 10 minutes. Veronica told police that she was going to the bar to meet a man and woke up hours later in a stranger's car on the other side of the parking lot. She told officers that she didn't feel like she'd been drugged or sexually abused. Veronica was arrested and charged with child neglect without great bodily harm and was booked into the Volusia County Branch Jail. The Department of Children and Families took custody of the child. Veronica was later released on a $2,500 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 52-year-old Andrew Cabrera is behind bars for threatening her former roommate as she was moving out of her home. On Monday the 30th of October, authorities responded to a residence in the 14,000 block of Northwest 21st Court in Citra, Florida on reports of a disturbance. When deputies arrived on scene, they learned that Andrea had a new roommate who had been living in the house for about four or five days. They kicked her out because their arrangement wasn't working out. The woman asked her friend to come and help her but Andrea believed they weren't packing up fast enough. Andrea became more and more agitated as she was trying to make them pack faster. That's when she armed herself with an axe. I'm gonna fuck you up, Andrea told the woman and her friend, before swinging the axe into the wall a few times. Andrea told deputies that the woman was not packing fast enough and told them to chop chop and hurry up. She also said she thought they could pack up quicker and they needed to work harder. Andrea, who has two prior charges for battery, said she got the axe for protection and did not verbally threat or wield the weapon. Andrea was arrested and charged with two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and one count of battery. She was transported to the Marin County Jail, where she remains on a $7,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. Laurie Wilds is behind bars for assaulting a man during an argument about rum. On Wednesday the 1st of November, Authorities responded to a residence in Marin County, Florida on reports of an attack. When deputies arrived at the scene, they observed a small scrape with fresh blood coming out of the victim's head. The victim told deputies that he was in the garage when Laurie came in and began arguing about missing rum in the home. The man said that he doesn't drink rum, and that's when Laurie went into a rage and started knocking things over. She then grabbed the man around the neck and started punching him. The man was able to get away, but Laurie went after him and hit him in the head with a hammer. The man didn't know what he was hit with at first, but then realised it was the blunt side of the hammer. Deputies then located a hammer with a black and blue handle. When deputies caught up with Laurie, they detected a strong odour of alcohol in her breath. She told deputies that the argument with the victim was only verbal, but then admitted to throwing an alcohol bottle at him and throwing his laptop on the floor. Laurie was arrested and charged with felony aggravated battery with a deadly weapon and is held at the Marin County Jail on a $500 bond. Roommates 35-year-old Cole Bressett and 51-year-old Chris Relation are behind bars after 42-year-old Jeffrey Karen was fatally shot and his body was dumped. Authorities said that Cole and Jeffrey got into a dispute involving drugs on the 24th or the 25th of October. Chris allegedly helped Cole after the killing 
and did not contact police about it. At around 4.30pm on Friday the 27th of October, hunters contacted authorities after discovering a dead man's body in a remote area about a quarter of a mile off Gore Road in Plainfield, Vermont. He was found lying face down in the clearing and there were burn marks and charring on and around the body. State troopers arrived at the scene and determined that the male died under suspicious circumstances. Authorities said there were multiple game cameras set up on the property, and the cameras showed a vehicle on the property early in the morning on the 25th of October. The vehicle was seen driving near the area where the body was found, and was seen leaving about 30 minutes later. Detective Sergeant Isaac Miriam of the Vermont State Police said that one of the photographs showed a fire in the area where the body was found. He said other members of law enforcement were showing photos from the scene and reported that the body may have been that of 42-year-old Jeffrey Caron due to his prior interactions with police, including a recent search warrant in Bar, Vermont, where drugs were found. The medical examiner conducted an autopsy two days later and identified the victim as Jeffrey Caron, who died from a gunshot wound to his chest, and his death was ruled a homicide. Sergeant Merriam said that police spoke with Joni Bressett, Jeffrey's co-defendant, who's facing drug charges following the search warrant that was executed in Bar. Police said Joni had been selling drugs out of her apartment in North Bar Manor, with Jeffrey's assistance. Joni said that Jeffrey and Chris appeared at her apartment on the 24th of October. She said she overheard the pair talking about robbing Cole of his drugs and money. Joni said that Chris and Cole lived together a few miles away, in Berlin Mobile Home Park. Authorities said that surveillance footage showed Jeffrey and Chris arriving and then leaving in Joni's apartment on the 24th of October. The video showed the pair leaving in Joni's Nissan Rogue SUV, and Chris is then seen returning to the apartment alone in Joni's vehicle the next day. Investigators said that Joni's Nissan appeared to match the vehicle seen in the game camera footage in Plainfield. On the 27th of October, police located and seized Joni's vehicle, and noted it had a significant amount of dried mud inside the wheel wells. Joni told authorities that several people had access to her vehicle since the 25th of October. Joni said she had access to Jeffrey's Facebook account and showed investigators messages between Jeffrey and Chris about drug transactions. While conducting a search of Joni's vehicle, blood was found on the rear passenger floorboard. On late Monday night on the 30th of October, police executed a search warrant at Chris and Cole's mobile home in Berlin. The pair were home at the time and were taken into custody after initially refusing commands of police. During an interview, Chris said he let Cole stay at his home and Cole paid him in crack cocaine, but he grew tired of the arrangement. Chris said that he no longer wanted Cole to live with him, but he and Jeffrey devised a plan to remove Cole from the home, taking his drugs and money in the process. Chris said that he lured Cole out of his home under the guise of a trip to Walmart, while Jeffrey snuck inside armed with a metal pipe awaiting their return. When Chris and Cole returned back at the mobile home, Jeffrey confronted Cole and during the altercation, Cole shot Jeffrey in the chest. Chris said he watched Jeffrey die, and Cole pointed the gun at him, telling him to keep his mouth shut. Chris told detectives that Cole then used Joni's vehicle to move Jeffrey's body, and Chris initially denied helping Cole move the body, but he later admitted to helping move Jeffrey's body to an area near the door. Chris said that Cole was alone when he drove with Jeffrey's body, and later returned about 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning, telling Chris that the matter had been taken care of, and not to ask any questions. Chris admitted he sent Jeffrey a message on Facebook asking about his whereabouts, even though he knew Jeffrey was dead. While interviewed with detectives, Cole admitted to using cocaine and had been living with Chris. He never said he met Jeffrey, nor had he heard of him, and denied causing Jeffrey any harm, nor disposing of his body. Cole was charged with second degree murder, and Chris was charged for accessory after the fact of second degree murder and remain held at the Northwestern State Correctional Facility without bond. Police said that Cole was wanted on pending arrest warrants for separate unrelated charges, including a felony count of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are searching for a man who's suspected of killing a female relative, and then taking a severed head with him. At around 3.40pm on Thursday the 2nd of November, authorities responded to a home at 2528 Pomo Trail in Santa Rosa, California on reports of a possible homicide. When officers arrived, they found a deceased woman inside. She had been decapitated, but they were unable to locate her head. Upon further investigation, police identified 24-year-old Luis Gustavo Roy Lopez of Santa Rosa as a suspect. 
It's believed that Lewis took the victim's head with him after leaving a residence, and that he may still be in possession of it. Police have not released the victim's name or age or relationship to the suspect, but neighbours said the victim was Lewis's grandmother. Lewis is described by police as a Hispanic male, being 5 foot 6 inches tall and about 150 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. He was last seen wearing a black hooded sweatshirt or jacket, black pants and white shoes. He has a number 420 and a marijuana leaf tattoo on the left side of his head. Police believe he walked south on Iroquois Street after leaving the home. Police don't know where he intends to go next or if he has a vehicle. He has relatives in the San Juan Quinn Valley, but police don't know if he intends to go in that direction. He was recently released from state prison and placed on post-release community supervision. He's been in prison for assault with a deadly weapon and weapon possession charges, unrelated to the victim in this case. The investigation into the matter continues. 37-year-old Denise Amy Law fatally beat an elderly woman during a dispute about the suspect's boyfriend. At around 2.40pm on Thursday the 2nd of November, authorities responded to a property at 3532 Riverway Drive in Baton Rouge, Louisiana on reports of an assault. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive elderly woman outside on the ground with multiple severe injuries to her head and face. Medics transported her to a local hospital, where she was pronounced dead. The victim was identified as 66-year-old Melissa Reed. Authorities said that Denise confronted Melissa inside the home because Denise believed Melissa wanted a relationship with her boyfriend. They argued and the dispute continued outside, where Denise hit Melissa with a metal walker. A witness informed police that Melissa fell to the ground, and Denise continued striking her until bystanders intervened. Denise also tossed Melissa's cell phone into a storm drain, which was later retrieved by firefighters. Police arrested Denise and charged her with first-degree murder, and she's held at the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison. It's unclear how the suspect and the victim knew each other. The investigation into the matter continues. A 75-year-old former teacher's aide of a private religious school in Tama, Wisconsin, will spend the next decade behind bars for forcibly and repeatedly sexually abusing a teenage boy. On Friday the 27th of October 2023, and Nelson Kosh was sentenced to 10 years in prison, with 15 years of supervised release for the assaults which occurred in 2016. On the 31st of July 2023, Anne was convicted to 25 separate counts related to abuse. The charges included 12 counts of sexual assault of a child in the second degree, 4 counts of child enticement sexual conduct, 8 counts of exposing intimate parts to a child, and 1 count of intimidating a victim. The district attorney's office argued for 100 years in prison. In 2016, Anne repeatedly forced the teen victim to engage in oral sex and sodomy in the basement of Toma Baptist Academy where she worked. In April of 2022, Anne was charged after a victim came forward to law enforcement and described the abuse he suffered. Judge Richard Radcliffe said Anne used a position of power over the victim to meet her own needs, recognising Anne was an authority figure trusted by the victim. Assistant District Attorney Sarah Skiles praised the victim for coming forward and reporting the abuse to law enforcement, and described him as an incredibly brave young man. She added that a sexual predator has been held accountable for her heinous actions, and will not be a threat to our community for the next 10 years. A 34-year-old man is behind bars for fatally stabbing his elderly parents. At around 11am on Thursday the 2nd of November, Authorities responded to a residence along Lincoln Avenue in Barnegat, New Jersey on reports of a disturbance. As officers approached the residence, they noticed a man walking away. Upon their arrival, they found blood stains on the front door and blood in various areas throughout the home. As officers entered the bedroom, they discovered the bodies of two deceased victims with stab wounds to their chests and observed a knife nearby. The victims were later identified as 71-year-old Eugene Mulgrew and 69-year-old Cheryl Mulgrew. During the investigation, authorities identified the couple's son Michael Mulgrew, who lived with his parents as a suspect. Police spotted him walking about a mile away in the area of West Bay Boulevard and Gunning River Road and he was taken into custody. He's charged with murder, criminal possession of a weapon for unlawful purpose, and unlawful possession of a weapon. He's held at the Ocean County Jail without bond. The motive of the attack is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. 
22-year-old Chelsea Nicole Lamkin is behind bars for fatally shooting 56-year-old Terence Heath Falks. At 12.31am on Monday the 30th of October, authorities responded to the 700 block of 3rd Avenue Southeast in Dakota, Alabama on reports of a shooting. A nearby neighbour who lives along 4th Avenue Southeast made a 911 call after hearing a single gunshot and a woman crying in the backyard of a home across the alley. When first responders arrived, they found Chelsea crying over the body of Terence in the backyard. A 9mm handgun was found between the man's legs and a 12-gauge shotgun beside his torso on the ground. A 9mm casing was also found near his body and a single gunshot entrance wound behind his right ear and he was bleeding profusely with no signs of life. Medics transported Terence to the Decatur Morgan Hospital where he was pronounced dead. The Morgan County Coroner collected small clear bags of cocaine and marijuana from Terence's clothing. During an interview with Chelsea, she said that she and Terence used drugs that made them paranoid. She continued by stating that Terence constantly believes people were trespassing his property and she and Terence would frequently discharge firearms into the air from the backyard to scare off any would-be trespassers. Chelsea said that she carried the handgun and that Terence carried the shotgun into the backyard because he thought someone was trespassing. She admitted to shooting the handgun into the air a few feet from Terence while he shot the shotgun at the same time. She claimed that Terence fell to the ground immediately after and was adamant that she did not shoot him. Chelsea was arrested and charged with manslaughter and she's held at the Morgan County Jail on a $100,000 bond. Chelsea has previously been arrested on drug-related charges. Her most recent charge was trafficking meth in Lawrence County in April of 2022 when Chelsea stuffed 69 grams of meth inside a bra. Terence also has a criminal history. On the 27th of December 2020, a Decatur resident filed a report with the Decatur Police Department for a home repair fraud. Terence was arrested after receiving funds from a resident in Morgan County to repair a plumbing issue while operating under the guise of a licensed and insured plumber. Authorities said he did not have an active business license and was not a licensed plumber by Alabama state law. He received $340 for purchasing materials for the job and to fix the plumbing issue. Terence did not finish the repair, and after causing extensive damage to the residents, he didn't return to finish the job or provide any materials. This wasn't the first time he was arrested for home repair fraud. In 2018, he was convicted in Lauderdale County for the same thing. A 31-year-old man has been convicted on multiple charges after beating and assaulting a 60-year-old woman and putting a body inside a plastic storage container, which the victim survived. On Tuesday, the 31st of October 2023, Delonte Edmund Gargo pleaded guilty to charges of felony assault, kidnapping, tampering with evidence, and having weapons under disability. In early May 2023, Delonte picked up the victim and drove her to his house at 3177 West 97th Street in Cleveland, Ohio. When they got to his residence, he physically assaulted her, stabbed her in the arm, zip-tied her hands and tortured her. At around 3.30pm on the 2nd of May, authorities responded to Delonte's home to conduct a welfare check after they were tipped off by a concerned woman at a nearby corner store, stating that Delonte showed her photos of a woman tied up in the basement. Responding officers encountered Delonte at his residence. After a 30-minute delay, he allowed officers to search his basement, where they only found an air mattress but no victim. It was during this initial visit that Delonte moved the victim from room to room to prevent police from finding her, and the officers left the premises. Later that evening, police spoke with a woman familiar with the area who claimed that she knew that Delonte had assaulted a woman and was holding her captive in the basement of his residence. She told police that Delonte even showed her photos of the assault and claimed the victim was a snitch, providing investigators with additional evidence of potential criminal activity. In the early hours of the 3rd of May, police returned to the residence and spoke to Delonte again. While inside the living room, officers heard moaning sounds from an unknown location. Each time the moaning occurred, Delonte amplified the volume of the radio playing on his phone. Suspicions grew, prompting officers to question Delonte further. Eventually, Delonte confessed that a woman was beneath the porch. Officers found the victim stuffed and folded into a tiny 3 foot by 3 foot plastic container. Her body was motionless with a lid sealed, but she was still alive. She was transported to a hospital with severe injuries, including multiple fractures to the back of her skull and a broken back and spine which left her paralyzed. She was in a coma for several days following her hospitalization. Cleveland County Prosecutor Michael O'Malley said, 
I've seen a lot of truly terrible cases over the years, and this one is one of the most horrific I've seen. Delonte will be sentenced on the 29th of November, and he faces up to 25 years in prison. 26-year-old Cameron Kearney is behind bars for assaulting his disabled roommate. The victim is a 36-year-old roommate who's autistic and receives monthly disability payments, who lived with Cameron for about a year. On the 27th of October, authorities responded to an apartment at 208 Victor Street in San Antonio, Texas to arrest Cameron after the woman was hospitalized with severe injuries. The incident occurred two days prior, when a caretaker was bathing the victim and Cameron became upset because the victim urinated on herself and he felt like she needed to be punished. Cameron then poured jugs full of scalding hot water over the victim while she was still in the shower causing severe burns. He then forced the woman to stand in the corner until her legs were swollen and poured rubbing alcohol on her and set her on fire with a match burning her arms. The fire was somehow put out and the victim fell to the floor, so Cameron poured alcohol on the woman's legs and set her on fire again. She suffered severe burns to her neck, back, arms and legs. Cameron's charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and injury to a disabled person causing serious bodily injury. He's held at the Bear County Jail on a $250,000 bond. Cameron has a criminal history and has previously faced four other assault charges, including assault on a public servant dating back to 2017. The investigation into the matter continues. 34-year-old Tevis Walker is behind bars for fatally shooting 15-year-old Janiah Carr. At 11.50am on Wednesday the 1st of November, a woman walking a dog found a deceased teenage girl in a wooded area behind the Carriage House East Apartments in Indianapolis, Indiana. The woman contacted police, who responded to the scene. Officials said that the victim, who was later identified as 15-year-old Janiah Carr, had a bullet wound to her right cheek and trauma to the back of her head. Authorities said that she lived at the apartment complex with her mother and was listed as a runaway on the morning of the 30th of October, as she previously left the home for short periods of time before. Investigators used surveillance video from the Carriage House East Apartments to piece together a timeline of events. At 4.32am on the 28th of October, Cameron showed Janiah walking up to a black 2018 Kia Optima, registered to Tevis. She then talks to the driver, gets into the passenger seat before the car drives away. At 5.21am, another camera shows the Kia drive into the grass area behind the building and turn off its lights in a spot where Janiah's body was later found. After the lights of the vehicle go off, movement can be seen, but the view is not clear. Video then shows the suspect walk from the car to the dumpster twice, and then appears to put something in the car's trunk. At 5.25am, the suspect parked the Kia in the parking lot, then walked to his apartment just a few hundred feet from the scene. Authorities said that Tevis had recently been hired as a maintenance man for the apartment complex where he lived, despite having outstanding arrest warrants in Alabama for narcotics and a handgun offence, as well as an unknown warrant out of Georgia. On the evening on Thursday, the 2nd of November, officers stopped Tevis near 86th Street and Chadland Avenue, and he was taken into custody. During an interview with detectives, Tevis confirmed that the Kia Optima was his, and he was the only person who operated it. He said he remembered picking up a girl, he claimed she recognised him from being around the area, but did not know her name, and drove her several miles east to buy an iPad. Tevis said that the person who was going to sell the iPad never showed up, so he drove her back. Tevis is charged with murder, and is out of the Marion County Jail without bond. The motive of the killing is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. A 37-year-old man is behind bars on charges of having sexual relations with an underage victim. At 2.32pm on Friday the 3rd of November 2023, Joseph David Lyonbury was arrested in the 600 block of Garrick Road in Salisbury, North Carolina. He was charged with statutory rape, taking indecent liberties with a child, and first-degree sex offence with a victim under the age of 13. Joseph is held without bond at the Rowan County Jail. This isn't Joseph's first offence. On the 25th of May 2021, Joseph was charged with one count of first degree statutory sex offence and taking indecent liberties with a child in one case involving a five-year-old boy and first degree statutory sex offence in a second case involving a nine-year-old boy. Bond was set at $250,000. The investigation into the matter continues. 
18-year-old Kenzie Varner stales behind bars for attempted murder of a police officer after stabbing the man in the face with a screwdriver. The incident occurred at around 6.15am on Saturday the 4th of November, when Officer Bramer was unlocking Lindsay Duval Park in Mount Washington, Kentucky as part of his morning shift. Bramer said he saw a teen inside the locked park and told her to come to the cruiser and asked her for her information. But as Bramer was writing down the details, Kinsey took off running down Dwayne Way and then to Emma Court. Bramer chased her down, commanding her to stop. Eventually, the teen stopped and put her hands in the air. As Bramer tried to place her in handcuffs, Kinsey spun around with a screwdriver in her hand and struck him in the face. According to police, she stabbed him nearly three inches above his left eye. Authorities said that Kenzie was trying to cause serious physical injury and possibly kill Bramer. Medics later responded to the scene and treated Bramer's wound. He was taken to hospital but has since been released and is expected to be okay. Kenzie was booked into the Bullock County Detention Centre and charged with attempted murder. On the morning of the 6th of November, Kenzie appeared in court and entered a not guilty plea and she's been held on the $500,000 bond. She's scheduled to return to court on the 29th of November. Forty-year-old Terrell Anderson is behind bars after shooting his two stepsons following an altercation. At around 8.25pm on Sunday the 29th of October, authorities responded to a home in the 21,100 block of East 50th Terrace Drive South in Independence, Missouri and reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, the caller Terrell's wife said her husband shot her two sons. Officers found the victims dead in the kitchen with four shell casings near their bodies and four more casings in the trash can in the kitchen. The victims were identified as 23-year-old Adonis Knight and 30-year-old Mario Batres. Authorities obtained surveillance footage from inside the home that showed the assaults in the sub-basement and at the door to the garage between Terrell and the two brothers. Terrell could be seen holding the handgun in his left hand approaching one of the victims holding a knife in the lower living room while the mother held her son back. The other brother was in the kitchen looking at his phone unarmed. Terrell went to the base of the stairs and fired one of two warning shots into the kitchen ceiling. The mother then escorted her two sons out of the house, but both returned because one of them didn't have his car keys and Terrell had entered the kitchen. While back inside the house, the mother tried to keep one of her sons away from Terrell. The victim then reached around his mother to try to hit Terrell, who stepped back. When the son tried to hit him again, Terrell shot him and the victim fell to the floor. Terrell then shot the other victim despite the fact that the stepson made no attempt to do anything. While both victims lay face down on the ground, Terrell stood over them and stomped on one of the victims and shot both of them repeatedly. Terrell remained on the scene while his wife called 911. His three biological children, all juveniles, were upstairs at the time of the shooting. In an interview with detectives, Terrell claimed self-defense. He said he went to grab a gun in the garage after he was assaulted and went to the kitchen where he shot both victims. Terrell said while he was unsure how many times he fired his gun, one victim had a knife and the other victim had a gun but the video showed that neither victim had a weapon when they were shot, and one son was never armed at any point. Terrell was arrested and charged with second-degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, and two counts of armed criminal action. He's held at the Jackson County Jail on a $250,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A 36-year-old woman has been arrested after she was driving drunk and crashed her car with the children inside. At around 5.50pm on Friday the 3rd of November, authorities responded to Huntington Expressway, near Union Avenue in Providence, Rhode Island, on reports of a multiple vehicle collision. Police said a silver Honda was travelling along Huntington Expressway when it struck a Ford Explorer, causing the Explorer to hit a blue Nissan. Police said that Stefan Garcia was drunk behind the wheel of a silver Honda when she caused the three-car pile-up. Her two children, aged nine and six years old, were in the car at the time. Both children were taken to the Hasbro Children's Hospital with minor injuries. No other injuries were reported. Stephane failed several field sobriety tests and she was arrested. She's charged with driving under the influence. Two counts of driving under the influence with a passenger under 13 years of age. Reckless driving and refusal to submit to a chemical test. Police said the incident meant Stephane violated her probation for cruelty to or neglect of a child and she was subsequently remanded to the adult correctional institutions. The children were taken into the custody of the Department of Children, Youth and Families. The investigation into the matter continues. 22-year-old Clayton Snyder has been arrested after a 10-year-old boy spotted the man recording him while he went to the toilet. On the 7th of October, 
The boy was eating dinner with his family at the Grand Floridian Resort and Spa at Walt Disney World in Lake Buena Vista, Florida, when he excused himself to go to the restroom. When he returned to the table, the boy whispered into his father's ear that a strange man had photographed him over the top of the bathroom stall. The boy and his father returned to the bathroom, where the boy recognized Clayton's black sketcher sneakers and pointed the man out to his father. Clayton was not using the restroom, but was just standing there. He repeatedly denied taking photos of the boy when the father confronted him. The father followed Clayton as he left the restroom, calling to resort staff to stop him. Another member of the boy's family approached the group, asking Clayton to hand over his phone, which had a Lila and Stitch case, while recording the interaction on her own device. After fiddling with his phone for a few minutes, presumably deleting potentially incriminating evidence, he then handed the device to the woman. When police arrived, the family told them that Clayton was still in a restaurant with his own family. Clayton told police that he knew the family suspected him of photographing their son, but denied that he had done so. Clayton gave permission for an Orange County deputy to open his phone after accessing hidden and deleted photo albums. The deputy found a video of the same boy sitting on the toilet in the bathroom stall, with his pants around his ankles. Clayton's phone died shortly after police viewed the footage, and he denied them permission to unlock his Apple Watch. Clayton was arrested and charged with felony video voyeurism, and he was booked into the Orange County Jail, but has since been released on a $5,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. Police were investigating after a 32-year-old woman was fatally shot. At around 3.45am on Monday the 6th of November, authorities responded to the intersection of 16th Street and McKnight Mill Road in Greensboro, North Carolina on reports of a person laying in the middle of the road. When officers arrived, they found a woman suffering serious injuries after being shot. The victim, identified as 32-year-old Shanita Allen, later died and her death was ruled a homicide. No arrests have been made to date, and the motive of the attack is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. 37-year-old Johnny Robinson is behind bars for fatally shooting his estranged wife, who had a protective order against him. At just before 4.30am on Tuesday the 7th of November, authorities responded to a home along Garrick Road in Roseland, Louisiana on reports of shots fired. When officers entered the home, they found an unresponsive woman with a gunshot wound. She was pronounced dead at the scene. The victim was identified as 31-year-old Brittany London, who was a mother of six children. Authorities identified a husband, Johnny Robinson, of nearby Amit as a suspect, and he was arrested. Johnny's charged with second-degree murder and one count of violation protective order, and he's held at the Tangy Pahoa Parish Jail. The investigation into the matter continues. Former Loveland, Colorado police officer 28-year-old Dylan Miller is behind bars for sexually assaulting a teenage girl while on duty. On the 23rd of October, the Loveland Police Department in Colorado was contacted by a 15-year-old girl's family about the assault that took place at Northland Park in Loveland. Investigators said that in late July, Dylan conducted a traffic stop of a car in which several people, including a girl, were riding in. Several days later, while on duty, Dylan drove into the park at night and saw the girl and another person. He told the other person to leave and asked the victim to walk with him to a secluded wooded area away from the street where he sexually assaulted her. After receiving the complaint, the Loveland Police Department requested that the Larimer County Sheriff's Office conduct the investigation to avoid a conflict of interest, and the girl was interviewed on the 26th of October. The following day, when Dylan arrived for work, he was put on administrative leave while the matter continued to be investigated. Authorities said that after conducting interviews and gathering digital evidence, a warrant for Dylan's arrest was issued. On Monday the 6th of November, Dylan was fired from the Loveland Police Department and he was arrested. He's charged with first degree kidnapping, sexual assault on a child from someone in a position of trust, misconduct, official oppression, and unlawful sexual conduct by a peace officer. He's had at the Larimer County Jail on a $300,000 bond. Dylan was hired by the Loveland Police Department on the 20th of May 2022. He previously worked for the Durango Police Department from September of 2020 to May of 2022. 22-year-old Eduardo Galvez is behind bars after beating and stabbing his landlord to death during a dispute. The incident occurred at around 2.30pm on Monday the 6th of November when the landlord had gone to the apartment at 719 Southwest 1st Avenue in Homestead, Florida 
to check on his tenant Eduardo. After receiving multiple complaints that the tenant had been creating a disturbance within the complex, Eduardo and the landlord then got into a verbal altercation, which then turned physical. Neighbours heard the commotion and called police. When police arrived, Eduardo opened the apartment door but quickly shut it while yelling obscenities at the officers. Eduardo refused to comply with the officers when they ordered him to open the door, and he barricaded himself inside. Officers eventually made their way inside and found the landlord on the floor covered in blood. The landlord had blunt force trauma and deep lacerations above his right eye, puncture wounds to the left side of his face and neck, as well as a fracture to the back of his head. The landlord later died at hospital when his identity hasn't been released. Eduardo refused to come out of the bathroom but was later taken into custody, though he had to be tased several times. Eduardo was taken to the Homestead Hospital to be checked out, and was later booked into their Miami Day Jail. He's facing several charges including second degree murder, and resisting an officer without violence. On Tuesday the 7th of November, Eduardo appeared in bond court, where Miami Day Judge Mindy Glazer ordered him to be held without bond. Neighbours said the victim was a good person, and said Eduardo seemed troubled and was often heard screaming and yelling by himself. It was always bangs, it was always him throwing stuff around. It was always him yelling at nothing, one neighbour said. The investigation into the matter continues. A 43-year-old man is behind bars for shooting his ex-girlfriend and her adult son. At just before 10.30pm on Tuesday the 7th of November, authorities responded to a home along Day Spring Trace in Lawrenceville, Georgia, on reports of a domestic dispute. Responding officers parked their vehicles a few houses away and heard gunshots coming from the driveway as they approached the home on foot. A man was seen fleeing the scene in a car. In the driveway, officers found a 44-year-old woman and a 20-year-old son with gunshot wounds to their head. Officers attempted life-saving measures until medics arrived. The victims were transported to a local hospital where they remain in a critical condition. During the investigation, police identified the female victim's ex-boyfriend Terence Alonzo Washington as a suspect. Several hours after the shooting, police arrested Terence roughly 120 miles away in Warner Robins and charged him with two counts of aggravated assault, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, possession of a firearm by convicted felon, and theft by taking. Terence remains held at the Houston County Jail without bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A nurse in an assisted living facility has been arrested after she beat up an elderly patient with dementia. 24-year-old Cassandra Ahe was charged with battery on a person at least 65 years old in connection with the incident. At around 10.25pm on Friday the 27th of October, the patient was walking down the hallway of the gardens of Eastbrook Care Facility in Castleberry, Florida, when Cassandra spotted her and attempted to help her back to her room. The patient became combative, and Cassandra was observed on surveillance footage grabbing and pulling the woman's hair to control her. When Cassandra gained control, she pulled the patient to her room and pushed her inside. Once the two were inside the room, Cassandra was heard screaming for about five minutes before another staff member entered the room to help out. The staff member said that when she entered the room, she found the patient bleeding from her face. Cassandra said she hit the patient's face with an object before slamming her face against the wall, which caused the facial injuries and bleeding. The patient complained of pain and discomfort and was transported to hospital two days after the incident when her face became severely bruised. Doctors said the patient suffered fractures to her face and nose. The patient's trip to the hospital led to an investigation at the care facility. On Thursday the 2nd of November, Cassandra was arrested and booked into the Seminole County Jail and she was released after posting a $5,000 bond. 31-year-old Melissa Marie Curtis is behind bars for the sexual abuse of a 14-year-old boy that occurred almost a decade ago. The former teacher of the Montgomery Village Middle School in Maryland reportedly engaged in sex acts with the 8th grader at least 20 times. Melissa had been a teacher at the school for two years before the abuse began in January of 2015 when she was 22 years old. She gave him oral sex in the classroom at the school and abused him at a nearby movie theatre, in a car, and they had sex in both the bedroom and living room of her mother's house in Germantown, as well as at his home. She gave the boy alcohol and marijuana, and also encouraged him to perform oral sex on her, before the abuse ended in May of that year. Police began their investigation on the 5th of October 2023, when the boy, who is now an adult, came forward with the allegations. A warrant for her arrest was issued on the 31st of October. On the morning of Tuesday the 7th of November, Melissa turned herself in to authorities. 
She's charged with sexual abuse of a minor and multiple counts of third and fourth degree sexual offences. She's held at the Montgomery County Jail. A 32-year-old woman is behind bars for fatally shooting her two sons. At 11.07am on Wednesday the 8th of November, authorities responded to a home at 213 Bentwood Drive in Shepherdsville, Kentucky and reports of two children shot. When officers arrived, they entered the residence and found two young boys barely alive in a bedroom covered in blood with gunshot wounds and they were transported to Norton Children's Hospital. By 2.50pm, both children were pronounced dead. The boys have been identified as half-brothers nine-year-old Peanut Howard and six-year-old Hayden Howard. Police said a neighbour went into the home and made the grisly discovery after finding their mother Tiffany Lucas outside. A witness at the scene told police that Tiffany shot her sons. A gun believed to be used in the shooting was found on a bed and Tiffany was taken into custody. At 3.45pm, she was booked into the Bullock County Detention Centre and charged with two counts of murder. Court records show Tiffany previously spent a month in jail for a drug possession conviction. Alex Payne, the Chief Deputy of the Bullock County Sheriff's Office said, Whether you think it's mental illness, just pure evil, a combination of both, it could be substance abuse, any combination thereof, pick your poison, none of it's good, the result is horrific. The father of one of the victims is deceased, the father of the other victim is unknown, whereabouts are unknown, other family members who got a hold of and made notification, he said. The investigation into the matter continues. A couple were behind bars after their four-year-old daughter died earlier this year from long-term abuse. On the 29th of April, police responded to an emergency room in Alvin, Texas, in reference to an unresponsive young girl who had been brought in by a mother, 26-year-old Jane Bell. The little girl was already deceased by the time officers arrived. Police said the victim's father, 27-year-old Drone Donahue, initially said her daughter fell while playing with her siblings in the courtyard of the motel where they lived. Further investigation revealed the parents took measures to alter evidence at the scene. Police said they observed signs of long-term abuse and called the investigation lengthy and complex, as detectives had pieced together the facts. Autopsy results revealed that four-year-old Roy Lynn Donahue died of complications of recurrent physical trauma and malnutrition. The medical examiner ruled Roy Lynn's death a homicide. On Thursday the 9th of November, the couple were arrested at their home and have each been charged with two counts of tampering with evidence. Authorities said additional felony charges against the parents are pending. They're held at the Brazoria County Jail with their bond set at $100,000. The couple's three other children, including a newborn, have been removed and placed into the custody of Child Protective Services. 32-year-old Scott Allen Ecred is behind bars for repeatedly raping a 13-year-old girl. He's accused of continually abusing the schoolgirl at her home in the 100 block of East Tyler Street in Alexandria, Indiana, between October and December of 2022. Scott is believed to have used a credit card to unlock the girl's bedroom door before pushing her onto her bed, duct taping her mouth and sexually assaulting her. After the assaults, Scott only removed the tape after warning the girl to keep her mouth shut about what happened, reminding her how crazy his family is. In June of 2023, Scott sent the girl partially nude photos over Snapchat in his boxes that included winking emojis. After he sent these images, the girl spoke with family and Alexandra Monroe High School social workers about the molestations. Both the family and counsellors at the school contacted law enforcement. While interviewed, the girl told investigators that there were two instances where Scott placed duct tape over her mouth and had intercourse with her. Authorities said they found evidence of text messages where Scott asked the girl if she told anyone along with a picture of a large wooden knife with a name carved into it, which was taken to be a threat. It was not immediately clear how Scott knew the girl. On the 26th of October, Scott was arrested outside a house in the 300 block of John Street in Alexandria, about half a mile away from where the assaults took place. He's been charged with two counts of child molesting, child solicitation and intimidation, and he's held at the Madison County Jail on a $100,000 bond. Earlier this year, on the 22nd of July, Scott was arrested and served time in jail for firearm offences and possession of meth, and was later released on the 2nd of October. 41-year-old Robin Caesar is behind bars for fatally shooting his ex-girlfriend, 34-year-old Fridoline Daniel. Fridoline lived with her 16-year-old daughter at Meadows on the Greens apartment complex at Meadows Circle in Boynton Beach, Florida. At around 8am on Wednesday the 8th of November, Fridoline dropped her daughter off at school when she noticed Robins was following her. Concerned for her safety, she entered Boynton Beach Police Department and Robins went inside with her. 
Had just after 8am, Fridolin reported to an officer that her boyfriend was harassing her. Authorities have not released additional details about what happened while they're at the station. At 8.55am, Fridolin arrived at the parking lot of her apartment complex and Robins was there waiting for her with a gun. Fridolin was on the phone with her aunt in Haiti at the time of the attack and was heard to say, Oh, did you bring a gun to kill me? Before she was shot. Neighbours heard gunshots and called police. When officers arrived on scene, they found Fridolin in the parking lot deceased with multiple gunshot wounds, with shell casings strewn on the pavement around her. Surveillance footage captured a black Honda fleeing the area, which was confirmed to be Robins' vehicle. Later that afternoon, Robins was found a couple of miles away at a home he was known to frequent, along the 100 block of Northwest 14th Avenue, and he was arrested. In an interview with detectives, Robins said that he and Fridolin had broken up, and he'd been trying to convince her to be in a relationship with him again, but she refused. Robins confessed to the shooting, telling officers that he couldn't bear to see Fridolin with another man, and that the final straw was her reporting him to police early that morning. He's charged with first-degree murder with a firearm, and he's held at the Palm Beach County Jail without bond. Borden Beach Police said they've launched an investigation to determine whether the officer who interacted with Robins and Fridolin at the police department prior to the shooting followed procedure. The officer has since been placed on administrative leave. The investigation into the matter continues. 20-year-old Angel Lynn Marine Varner is behind bars in connection to the death of a seven-month-old son. At around 11.30am on Monday the 6th of November, police responded to a duplex at 3202 Center Street in Amarillo, Texas on reports of an unresponsive infant. Before officers arrived, paramedics determined the infant, Jackson Knight Blackman, was already dead. After an autopsy was performed two days later, it was determined that Jackson died from blunt force trauma. Angel lived in the duplex with Jackson's father and two other roommates. At around 2.30am on the day of his death, Jackson woke up and was crying in his crib in the living room. A roommate, who was sleeping in the living room with a boyfriend, told police Angel came into the living room, got a son and took him into the bedroom. The roommate heard a thud from the bedroom and then went back to sleep. When police interviewed Angel after the autopsy, she admitted throwing Jackson on the bed and swaddling him with two blankets. She then applied pressure to his abdomen until he stopped crying. She then threw Jackson on the floor. Angel told police she realised Jackson was not breathing, but instead of calling 911 she went to sleep. The day prior to admitting to killing a child, Angel set up a GoFundMe that suggested the boy's death was a mystery. She stated she was raising funds for the cost of Jackson's funeral, cremation, and for jewellery to hold his ashes in so he will always be with her. The fundraising has since been removed from the platform, and all donors' funds have been refunded. Angel was arrested and charged with murder, and she's held at the Potter County Jail on a $250,000 bond. Two men are behind bars for fatally stabbing a man. At 10.44am on Wednesday the 8th of November, authorities responded to the area of 521 Loop Street in Collinsville, Illinois in reports of an unresponsive male found lying in a ditch. When officers arrived, they found a man with a large laceration to his upper torso and he was pronounced dead at the scene. The victim was identified as 21-year-old Tyrese Owens. The major case squad of Greater St. Louis were called in to help and assigned around 20 investigators to the case. They followed up on numerous leads and asked the public's help in gathering further information. The next day on Thursday the 9th of November, the Major Case Squad arrested 23-year-old Carlos Mosley and 22-year-old Amari McGee. They're charged with two counts of first-degree murder and remain held at the Madison County Jail. The motive of the attack is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. Police are investigating the fatal shooting of a man that led to the death of his infant son. At 10.05am on Wednesday the 1st of November, authorities responded to a home in the 700 block of North 17th Street in Billings, Montana on reports of a shooting. A witness told 911 that she saw a pickup truck pull up to the house and started firing multiple shots inside the residence, but said she didn't think anyone was home. When officers arrived, they found at least 25 shell casings outside the home and officers continued to investigate. When officers could not make contact with anyone in the home, they forced entry and located a deceased man with gunshot wounds to his torso. They also found an unresponsive infant pinned underneath the man's body. Authorities said it appears a man was holding the infant and collapsed from his wounds and fell on the child. Medics transported the child to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. 
The man was identified as 31-year-old Kenneth Morrison, and the infant as Tateek Morrison. Tateek died just one day before his first birthday. Investigators obtained a description of the suspect's vehicle and located it parked behind a house on the 300 block of South 28th Street. Witnesses reported seeing people get out of the pickup truck and run into a home, and others running out and into another nearby house. Both homes were locked down and a SWAT team were called to the scene. After about five hours, ten people exited the house and were taken into custody, but no arrests have been made in connection to the shooting. The investigation into the matter continues. 18-year-old Mauricio Quinteros is behind bars for fatally shooting a man because he flirted with his girlfriend at a party. At around 2.20am on Sunday the 5th of November, authorities responded to a home in the 1600 block of North Betty Lane in Las Vegas, Nevada after receiving multiple 911 calls that a man had been shot. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive male victim in the backyard with multiple gunshot wounds. Medics pronounced him dead at the scene. The victim was identified as May called Regina Perez. Officers secured the scene and obtained witness statements and video surveillance from neighbours. During the investigation, Mauricio was identified as a suspect. Police said that the victim was attending the party when a physical altercation occurred and the suspect shot him before fleeing the scene. Detectives spoke with a witness who said she was hanging out with May Cool at a party having drinks by a fire pit. She told police that she invited a friend and gave her the address through Instagram. At around 1.20am, a friend arrived with her boyfriend Mauricio and two other unknown women. A second witness told police that Mauricio already seemed drunk when he arrived. The first witness told police that at one point in the night, Mauricio approached Michael and confronted him about hitting on his girlfriend. Mauricio asked to speak to Michael privately by the side of the house. He then punched Michael in the face, then took a few steps back and pulled out a black firearm from the front of his waist area before shooting him. Once the victim was on the ground, Mauricio shot him multiple times. In total, the witness said that the suspect fired five to seven rounds. Mauricio then yelled for two people to get into his car and fled the scene in a blue Dodge Challenger. Investigators collected evidence from the scene, including 640 caliber cartridge cases, assorted cans and bottles of alcohol and liquor, and observed blood as well. At 2.18pm, authorities located Mauricio and his girlfriend at the Westgate Resort and Casino. While taking Mauricio into custody, police found a black 40 caliber firearm in his possession. The weapon was removed from his front waist area and secured. Mauricio is charged with open murder and is held at the Clark County Detention Center without bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 20-year-old Dakota Grilly is behind bars for fatally shooting his girlfriend Trisha Renee Cole. At 9.55am on Thursday the 9th of November, a family member called 911 to report that Dakota shot Trisha with a long rifle along Coyote Drive in Clover Township, Pennsylvania, and was intending to provoke a lethal response of suicide by a cop. At 10.25am, police arrived at the scene and spotted Dakota nearby. They instructed him to freeze, but Dakota defied the orders and discharged two rounds from his weapon, triggering police to return fire. Dakota then fled in a Ford pickup truck. Dakota travelled a short distance before crashing his vehicle into a wooded area on Dickey Road and then fled on foot. By 11.35am, authorities had Dakota in custody and transported him to Penn Highlands Hospital. While there, he threatened the lives of medics attempting to treat him. During an interview with police, Dakota admitted to shooting Trisha with a rifle, saying I fucking shot her. When questioned about the weapon's whereabouts, Dakota laughed and said it was in my hand. The gun believed to be used in the shooting was later discovered in Dakota's crashed vehicle. At around 1.35pm, authorities returned to Coyote Drive and found Trisha's body. She had a gunshot wound to her head and a tire track over her body. Dakota's charged with criminal homicide, murder and two counts of terroristic threats. Dakota remains held at the Jefferson County Jail with bond denied. The motive of the killing is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. 18-year-old Jalen Elliott Joseph is behind bars for shooting his 20-year-old brother over a video game. In the early morning hours of the 9th of November, authorities responded to the Pelican Isle Apartments complex in Sebastian, Florida on reports of a disturbance between brothers arguing over a PlayStation. Jalen was reportedly upset that he lost to his older brother while playing an NBA video game. After investigating and determined that no crime had been committed, the officers had gone back to their patrol vehicle in the parking lot and heard a gunshot. They then saw Jalen running from the apartment, followed by his father who was shouting that Jalen had shot his brother in the chest. 
The officers gave chase and eventually apprehended Jalen in the woods at around 3am. They also recovered the handgun used in the shooting. The victim, his name has not been released, was transported to hospital where he remains in a critical but stable condition. Jalen's charged with attempted murder, possession of a firearm by convicted felon, grand theft of a firearm, and resisting arrest without violence. He's held at the Indian County Jail on a $655,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A couple injected their one-year-old daughter with meth after she suffered severe burns and then abandoned her at a local hospital. 31-year-old Amanda Mann and 30-year-old Dustin Michael Lawrence of San Antonio, Texas are charged with abuse, endangering a child risking bodily injury and related offences. On the evening of Friday the 3rd of November, Amanda was cooking spaghetti when a pot of boiling water spilled over onto the infant's body and face, causing severe burns. Instead of seeking medical help, Amanda contacted Dustin and asked him to bring home burn ointment. After applying the burn ointment to the girl's skin, the couple injected her with meth to mitigate the pain so she could sleep throughout the night. The following morning, when they pulled the sheets off the baby, her burns were so severe that parts of her skin peeled off and stuck to the sheets. The girl started having trouble breathing, so the pair did chest compressions. It wasn't until Saturday night, more than 24 hours after the incident, that they contacted a male family friend. He convinced them to take the girl to a hospital, which they did before abandoning her there. Doctors said the infant suffered burns to 17% of her body, and that she presented with 14 to 18 syringe marks on her skin. Authorities were alerted to the child's condition, and deputies went looking for the parents and found them in the hospital parking lot, and they were taken into custody. While questioned, Amanda told investigators that the baby had gotten burns while in the shower. However, she later told them that there was a pot of boiling water on the stove, and somehow the water spilled over her. Authorities said it's unclear whether the baby pulled the pot off the stove and onto herself, whether it was intentionally done or accidentally done by an adult. The couple have been held at the Bear County Jail, and their bail's been set at $450,000. Authorities said the couple have six children, a two-year-old, a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, and two-month-old twins. They all lived in a filthy RV on a block in San Antonio, Texas, where the newborns were born with no medical assistance. Authorities said that the couple's six-year-old son also tested positive for meth. One of the neighbours reported to police an incident when they saw one of the young children outside unsupervised walking the fence line. Investigators with Child Protective Services have involved the family since 2020, but there was no legal action taken. Child Protective Services have since taken custody of the children. Authorities said the baby girl's in a critical condition fighting for her life. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are investigating after a 28-year-old man was shot outside an apartment complex. At 1.42am on Sunday the 12th of November, authorities responded to the parking lot of Orleans Square Apartments in Shreveport, Louisiana on reports of a shooting. When officers arrived, they discovered a man in a critical condition with two gunshot wounds to his upper torso. They also found a woman with a non-life-threatening gunshot wound to her arm. They were both transported to the Oxnard LSU Health Hospital. Within two hours of being admitted to hospital, the man was pronounced dead. The Caddo Parish Coroner's Office identified the male victim as 28-year-old Kimura Kendrick of Shreveport. No arrests have been made to date, and the motive of the attack is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. 26-year-old Sophia Gastelum Vera is behind bars after a 23-month-old toddler son died from fentanyl exposure. On the morning of the 18th of October, Sophia woke up to find her son unresponsive and not breathing in a bedroom they shared at the home in the 4300 block of Genius Street in Fremont, California. She rushed her son to the local emergency room, where he was later pronounced dead. Police executed a search warrant of Sophia's residence and uncovered items associated with illicit drug use in the bedroom. Authorities said that the items later tested positive for the presence of fentanyl. Investigators also found messages on devices owned by Sophia regarding fentanyl use and possession. A toxicology report showed that the child had a high level of fentanyl in his system at the time of his death. On the 7th of November, Sophia was arrested and booked into the Santa Rita Jail. She was charged with involuntary manslaughter, willful cruelty to a child, possession of a controlled substance, and possession of drug paraphernalia. The investigation into the matter continues. 42-year-old Chad Christopher Stevens is behind bars after a missing woman's body was found at his home. Authorities said they received new information that led officers to believe that a body was at Chad's home 
at 601 Pearson Avenue, McKinney, Texas. On the morning of Sunday, the 12th of November, detectives with the assistance of the SWAT team showed up at the residence and ordered Chad to step outside before executing a search warrant. Police searched the property and located the body of 35-year-old Heather Louise Swab inside the home. Law officials were seen leaving the premises carrying a fridge and a body bag. Chad was arrested and charged with felony tampering with evidence with intent to alter or destroy human corpse. He's held at the Collin County Jail with bonds set at $150,000. Chad has a criminal history and has been arrested 24 times in Collin County including charges for assault, theft and drug offences. Heather's family who reported her missing recently said that Chad was her boyfriend. Neighbours said that Chad kept to himself and acted awkward and skittish around them. Police have released limited information on the case as the investigation into the matter continues. On Saturday the 11th of November, 31-year-old Taylor Ashley Orangdorf of Columbia, Missouri was arrested and charged with child abuse. A warrant for her arrest was issued on Friday the 3rd of November after a person close to the child noticed bruising and reported it to social services after the child told them that Taylor was pushing them down and hitting them. Taylor also allegedly hit the child with a pink toddler's high chair because she suspected the child spoke with social services about the abuse. Taylor's held at the Boone County Jail with bond set at $5,000 on the condition that she does not have contact with the victim or go within 500 feet of the victim's home. Taylor's relationship to the child is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. 20-year-old Stephen Freeman, who is accused of murdering 62-year-old Gabriel Seitz in 2022, faces new charges after authorities say he broke into the victim's home in Roseville, Michigan and committed criminal sexual conduct. On Thursday the 9th of November 2023, the Macomb County Prosecutor's Office added new charges of first-degree premeditated murder, first-degree home invasion and second-degree criminal sexual conduct to Stephen's current charges of felony murder, concealing the death of an individual and receiving and concealing a stolen motor vehicle. On Thursday the 27th of October 2022, Stephen broke into Gabrielle's Roseville home through a window when no one was home, but when the victim arrived, an altercation ensued resulting in Gabrielle's death. While driving Gabrielle's pickup truck later that day, Stephen collided with a semi-truck near Hayes and Common Roads in Roseville and fled the scene on foot. Police inspected the vehicle to find information about the driver and located Gabrielle's deceased body in the bed of the pickup truck. There was a shoelace around Gabrielle's neck and there was obvious signs of strangulation. McComb County Prosecutor Peter Lucido said, My office has augmented the charges against Stephen to reflect the gravity of his alleged actions. We stand resolute in our commitment to seek the truth and accountability. Thank you to the Roseville Police Department and the Michigan State Police for their extensive investigation. Stephen remains held at the Macomb County Jail without bond. 61-year-old Mark Ellen McEwen has been arrested for fatally striking his father with a vehicle and leaving the scene. At around 8.30pm on Saturday the 11th of November, authorities responded to R Bar at 245 108th Avenue in Treasure Island, Florida on reports of a fatal hit and run. The victim, 86-year-old Thomas Joseph McEwen was transported to hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Investigators determined that Mark struck and dragged his father with a 2019 Black Dodge Ram. Authorities learnt that Mark was driving the pickup truck when he backed into a parking space outside the bar. Thomas walked towards the truck, and he appeared to fall to the ground in front of the truck. The vehicle started moving forward, and ran over Thomas dragging him across the parking lot. Mark then reversed and moved the vehicle forward over his father's body multiple times and fling the scene before deputies arrived. Mark returned to the scene on foot and acted like he didn't know what happened. He then parked the truck in another location. He later admitted to driving the truck from the bar and returning to the scene, but he denied seeing his father on the ground and denied hitting anyone. Deputies however said that surveillance footage captured the entire incident. They also said they found blood and human tissue under the truck. Deputies took Mark into custody that night and he was booked into the Pinellas County Jail on a charge of leaving the scene of the crash involving death. He was released on a $50,000 bond the next day. The Sheriff's Office noted that impairment appeared to be a factor in the crash. The investigation into the matter continues. 30-year-old George Hill and 31-year-old Samantha Hill are behind bars for locking multiple children in a bedroom without adequate nourishment. On Tuesday the 12th of September, 
Authorities responded to the couple's home at 169 Harrison King Lane in Berry, Kentucky and report a possible animal neglect and a welfare check on the children at the home. A deputy said that the smell in the trailer nearly caused him to vomit and that they had malnourished dogs outside. There was no electricity to the home and there were clothes and trash scattered throughout the premises. Authorities later determined that the couple locked five kids in a bedroom for extended periods of time with limited food, water and no restroom breaks. Madison County Deputy Michael Stott said the children had been placed somewhere safe out of harm's way and are reportedly doing well. On Thursday the 9th of November, George and Samantha were arrested and charged with five counts of abuse and five counts of unlawful imprisonment and were booked into the Madison County Detention Centre. They appeared in court on Monday the 13th of November and pleaded not guilty to the charges. The investigation into the matter continues. A teenager is behind bars for fatally shooting his mother. At 12.36pm on Monday the 20th of November, authorities responded to a home at 2279 Warren Street in Toledo, Ohio on reports of a person shot. When officers arrived, they entered the premises and found a woman in a critical condition with a gunshot wound. She was transported to a local hospital where she was pronounced dead. The woman was identified as 53-year-old Deborah Baker. Authorities identified Deborah's 18-year-old son Joshua Brown, who lives with his mother as a suspect in the shooting. While questioned, Joshua admitted to shooting his mother. He told investigators that he heard someone coming up the stairs, which scared him. He grabbed a handgun he had on his lap, walked out into the hallway and shot once, striking and killing his mother. He was arrested and charged with reckless homicide and is held at Lucas County Correction Center. Four years ago, Toledo police posted on social media about Joshua when he was 14, after he went missing from his home on Warren Street and was later found. The post described him as being high-functioning autistic and having attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. On the 12th of May 2022, when Joshua was 17, he was walking near Putnam Street and Columbia Street at 4pm, where multiple shots were fired from an unknown SUV that drove by, police said at the time. He suffered one gunshot wound and was treated at Mercy Health St. Vincent Medical Center. Police did not identify any suspects in that case. The investigation into the matter continues. 27-year-old Kayla Michael Scott of Shreveport, Louisiana is accused of trying to rape his grandmother. On the evening of Saturday the 18th of November, Kaylin entered a room while masturbating, then tried to force himself on her. At 10.05pm that night, Kaylin was arrested and charged with attempted first degree rape. Kaylin admitted to all the acts and stated that he's attracted to older women. He remains held at the Shreveport City Jail. A 25 year old man is behind bars for multiple child sex offences. On the 16th of October, the Special Victims Unit at the Alamance County Sheriff's Office in North Carolina began to investigate a reported sexual assault of a minor. During the investigation, detectives identified Eric Maldonado Cardenas of Burlington as a suspect. On Thursday the 16th of November, Eric was arrested and charged with sex offence with a child by an adult, indecent liberties with a child, and rape of a child by an adult. Eric remains held at the Alamance County Jail on a $250,000 bond. On Friday the 17th of November, 42-year-old Joshua Daniel Quesenberry and 43-year-old Julie Diane Quesenberry of Ripley, West Virginia were arrested following a child neglect complaint. Investigators interviewed the couple's four children, who said that their parents threatened them and each other with guns on multiple occasions. Joshua and Julie have been charged with child neglect creating a risk of serious injury or death. They each held at the South Central Regional Jail on a $100,000 bond. A 30-year-old man is behind bars for shooting his girlfriend. At around 1.30am on Sunday the 19th of November, authorities responded to an apartment complex in the 1000 block of College Drive in Texarkana, Texas and found a 25-year-old woman suffering from a gunshot wound to the shoulder. She told police that her boyfriend, Gervante Wright, shot her in another apartment and she ran to a neighbor's apartment looking for help. Medics transported the victim to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The Texarkana police said that while Lieutenant Jeremy Courtney was responding to the call, he noticed a man getting into a vehicle along College Drive leaving the scene. He stopped the car a little over a mile away along St. Michael Drive and found that Cavante was a passenger. Cavante was taken into custody after other officers arrived at that location. He initially resisted their efforts to handcuff him, but he eventually complied. During this encounter, 
The officers could see a pistol laying on the floorboard under Cavante's feet. Cavante was arrested and charged with aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury and resisting arrest. He's held at the Bi State Jail with bond set at $120,000. The investigation into the matter continues. A Fulton County Detention Officer is accused of behaving inappropriately with a male inmate at the South Annex Jail in Union City, Georgia. On the night of Thursday the 16th of November, 37-year-old Latasha Baker was arrested and charged with three counts of possession of prohibited items by inmate and three counts of violation of oath of office. She was fired from her job the next day. Authorities said a second person, identified as 20-year-old Jaheem Arnold, was also arrested in connection to the contraband investigation. Jaheem was charged with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, possession of a firearm or knife during the commission of or attempt to commit certain crimes, willful obstruction of law enforcement officers, and several traffic violations. Authorities said Latasha was first employed as a detention centre officer with the Sheriff's Office from the 10th of February 2016 to the 12th of January 2022. She was rehired on the 7th of June 2023. Latasha and Jaheem are held at the Fulton County Jail without bond. Fulton County Sheriff Patrick Labbitt said, I'm committed to holding each and every employee accountable to the oath they've taken to protect and serve our community. The actions of this one officer are certainly not a reflection of the rest of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. The introduction of contraband to any of our facilities would not be tolerated, he said. The investigation into the matter continues. A 58-year-old caregiver at an assisted living home has been charged in connection with the death of an 82-year-old resident who wandered outside during a winter storm in 2022. On Monday the 20th of November 2023, Colin O'Connor was charged with second-degree vulnerable adult abuse in connection to the death of Lois Carey. The incident occurred in the morning hours of Friday the 23rd of December 2022 at Vista Springs Imperial Park at Timber Ridge Village on Park Lake Road in Lansing, Michigan. Colin twice saw Lois try to go outside without appropriate attire, into a blizzard with single-digit temperatures, sub-zero wind chill, and blowing and drifting snow. At 7am that morning, a snowplow driver discovered Lois partially covered in snow in the parking lot. The victim was transported to a local hospital via ambulance, where she died of hypothermia. Assisted living facility officials said that Lois was taking a dog for a walk and thought she may have become disoriented in the snow. The dog is okay and is with family members. Investigators said that Colin recklessly failed to act to protect the victim from going outdoors into the storm, resulting in her death. Colin has since posted a $5,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A woman has been charged with murder after assisting her mother's suicide. At 7.13pm on the 10th of September 2023, authorities responded to a home at 12901 Blue Quail Drive in Jones, Oklahoma after a 72-year-old woman, Linda Watts, took her own life. When officers arrived at the house, they found Linda deceased. During the investigation, detectives learned that the woman's 44-year-old daughter, J.D. Watts, intentionally provided the gun that Linda used to kill herself. Linda was diagnosed with dementia, and J.D. was her caregiver. J.D. told detectives that her mother told her to shoot her earlier in the day, but that she wouldn't do it. Police obtained ring camera video from inside the home on the day of Linda's death, which showed J.D. swearing at and berating her mother, calling her a toddler and threatening her by saying, take your pill or choke on it and die. J.D. left her mother's bedroom, walked into the garage and returned with a handgun. She showed her mother how to remove the gun from the holster and told Linda, do with it what you will. J.D. exited the room again and returned with a drill, saying she was going to lock her mother inside the bedroom. Linda then fired two shots, killing herself. After her mother shot herself, J.D. called a hospice worker and told her that her mother had shot herself with a gun that she provided to her. After the phone call, the hospice worker called the police and relayed the information to them. J.D. told the investigators it sucks being a 24-7 caregiver. On the 21st of November, Oklahoma City Police Department announced that the case was presented to the Oklahoma County District Attorney's Office and an arrest warrant was issued for J.D. J.D. turned herself in to the Midwest City Police on counts of felony murder by caretaker abuse and kidnapping. She was booked into the Midwest City Jail and was released after posting a $1 million bond. J.D.'s Facebook profile suggests that she recently survived cancer. In a 2017 Facebook post celebrating her mother's birthday, J.D. described Linda as an amazing mum. Linda's death came a week before her 73rd birthday. 
A 27-year-old high school art teacher is accused of sending inappropriate pictures to a 16-year-old student. On Monday the 20th of November, Emily Swinkowski, who taught at Water Valley High School in Mississippi, was arrested over the photos and charged with enticement of a child and child exploitation in connection with the incident. The case came to light after a different student learned about the teacher sending nude photos of herself to a victim and tipping off the principal, who then contacted police. Emily resigned following her arrest and was released on a $50,000 bond. A mentally ill man fatally shot his family and himself in a triple murder-suicide. At around 10am on Sunday the 19th of November, authorities responded to a residence at 129 East 9th Street in Lorraine, Ohio to complete a welfare check after receiving reports from neighbours of loose dogs wandering outside the home. When officers arrived at the apartment, they found the upstairs door open, and upon entry they found four bodies inside with gunshot wounds. Authorities said that 29-year-old Tyler Young shot his 24-year-old wife Skylar Young, their four-month-old son Bandon Young, and his nine-year-old stepdaughter Angel Isaac before turning the gun on himself. Investigators said they found Tyler in the living room with a gunshot wound to the head, and a 9mm firearm beside him used to shoot himself and the family. Authorities said they believe the killings took place some point between 1am and 10am on Sunday, adding there was no reports of gunshots in the area. Tyler's family said that Tyler was schizophrenic and fighting demons in his mind. In May of 2023, he was arrested on domestic abuse charges after slapping and choking Skylar in a business parking lot while she was 26 weeks pregnant with Bandon. However, the following month Skylar recanted a statement, claiming that she may have had a flashback to a prior incident. The case went ahead and was presented to a grand jury in Lorraine County, which chose not to indict Tyler. A 29-year-old man is behind bars for assaulting an elderly man with a baseball bat, causing serious injuries. At around 6.30am on Monday the 20th of November, authorities responded to the Lighthouse Hill Apartments in the 1200 block of West Lawn Court in Edgemore, Delaware on reports of an assault near a bus stop. When officers arrived, they found a 64-year-old male who had sustained multiple injuries to his upper body. The victim was transported to Christiana Medical Center in a critical condition. During the investigation, police learned that the suspect Rafael Murillo had fled the scene on foot towards Governor Prince Boulevard. Additional units responded to the area and located Rafael a short distance away. They apprehended him without incident and located the weapon. Raphael is charged with attempted murder and possession of a deadly weapon during the commission of a felony. He was arraigned and booked into the Howard R. Young Correctional Institution and remains held on a $90,000 bond. The motive of the attack is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. On Monday the 20th of November 2023, 28-year-old Demira Giway Finley was found guilty of murder in the 2020 stabbing death of a 26-year-old boyfriend, DeAndre Grant. At around 11.15pm on Wednesday, the 30th of September 2020, Demira called 911 and told dispatch that DeAndre had entered her apartment in the 1900 block of West Riverside Boulevard in Rockford, Illinois and collapsed. When officers arrived, they found DeAndre unresponsive with stab wounds to his chest and legs. He was transported to hospital where he was pronounced dead. Demira was identified as a suspect and she was arrested. Tamir is due to be sentenced on the 15th of December and faces between 20 to 60 years behind bars, followed by three years of supervised release. A 30-year-old man is behind bars for fatally shooting his 32-year-old girlfriend. At 11.23pm on Sunday the 19th of November, authorities responded to a residence in the 1100 block of Julia Avenue in Albany, Georgia on reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they entered the premises and found Nakeisha Warren unresponsive with multiple gunshot wounds, and she was pronounced dead at the scene. During the investigation, authorities determined that the victim's boyfriend, Rico LaShawn Hall, shot Nakeisha and fled the scene in her white Nissan Altima. Officers later received a report that Rico had wrecked the vehicle on Dishort Road in Sasa, located roughly 13 miles away, and left the wreck on foot. At around 4.30am on Monday the 20th of November, Authorities spotted Rico about two miles from the crash scene, strolling down Highway 82 near Mark's Melon Patch, heading back towards Albany. He was taken into custody but refused to speak to officers regarding the homicide. Rico's been charged with murder, aggravated assault and possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime. He's out at the Doherty County Jail. The motive of the attack is unclear 
as the investigation into the matter continues. A couple of behind bars after the newborn baby was almost beaten to death for crying too much. At 7.37pm on Sunday the 19th of November, authorities responded to the Juniper Hills apartment complex at 855 Louisville Road in Frankfort, Kentucky in report of a medical distress call. When officers arrived, they entered Unit 118 and found an unresponsive four-week-old baby with blue lips, blue colour around her eyes, and possibly an obstructed airway. She also had injuries on her head and neck. Medics transported the baby to Frankfurt Regional Medical Centre, then transferred her to University of Kentucky Children's Hospital for additional treatment due to the severity of her injuries. The suspect, the girl's father, 29-year-old Erin Fredrickson, told officers on scene that he intentionally physically assaulted the baby in an attempt to quiet her crying. Erin's girlfriend, the baby's mother, 19-year-old Helena Herbert, told detectives that she'd been aware of Erin's abusive behaviour towards her daughter since the beginning of November and had witnessed him causing physical injury to the newborn. She added that he told her of attempting to smother the baby with his hand multiple times and that she was afraid that he would hurt the baby further in future. Erin was arrested and charged with abuse of a child and domestic violence assault. He's held at the Franklin County Jail on a $1 million bond. Detectives said Helena had known of the abuse for several weeks and did nothing to stop it or report the matter to police. She was charged with abuse and failure to report neglect and abuse. She's also held at the Franklin County Jail on a $1 million bond. Police said the child is still being treated for multiple serious and potentially life-threatening injuries. The investigation into the matter continues. A middle school teacher is accused of exchanging nude photos and videos with a 14-year-old male student over Snapchat. On the afternoon of Friday the 17th of November, 30-year-old Caitlin Barnes from Boonville Junior High School in Arkansas was arrested at her home in Fort Smith and was charged with multiple child sex offences. Authorities said that Caitlin admitted sending the boy sexually explicit photos and videos of herself and directed him to do the same to arouse or gratify her sexual desires. The exchange took place during the night while they were at their own homes between the 17th and the 19th of October. The juvenile's mother learnt of the exchange and handed her son's iPhone over to authorities on the 20th of October, where explicit images and videos were found. Caitlin's been charged with sexual indecency with a child, producing, directing or promoting a sexual performance by a child, unlawful use of a communication device, and computer child pornography. She was held at the Logan County Detention Centre, and on Monday the 20th of November, she was released on a $25,000 bail. Caitlin's since been sacked from the school. 30-year-old Christopher Trayvon Smith is behind bars for assaulting his 20-year-old pregnant girlfriend. On the afternoon of Wednesday the 22nd of November, Christopher went over to his girlfriend's house in San Antonio, Texas to discuss a message she sent to her ex-husband. The victim told Christopher that she contacted her ex-husband to discuss their divorce and children. Christopher told her that she shouldn't have contacted him and punched her in the face several times. He then grabbed her by the neck and pinned her against the bedside table, continuing to assault her. The victim sustained injuries on her lip, right shoulder, rib cage and legs. The victim told officers that Christopher sprayed water on the bathroom floor and told her to tell her parents she slipped. He then fled the scene and was later arrested. Christopher's charged with assault of a pregnant person and felon in possession of a firearm and he's held at the Bear County Jail on a $90,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are investigating a triple homicide after a couple and their young son were found stabbed to death. At just after 6.30am on Sunday the 26th of November, Authorities responded to an apartment building at 674 East 136th Street in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx, New York on a report of a stabbing. When officers arrived, they discovered a deceased man lying in the lobby of the first floor of their building, covered in blood with multiple stab wounds to his chest. During the investigation, officers broke into an apartment after seeing a child lying on the ground and then found a woman's body both deceased with multiple stab wounds. The victims were identified as 38-year-old Jonathan Rivera, 33-year-old Hanio Peralta, and their five-year-old son, Caden Rivera. Authorities have ruled the deaths a homicide. Police said they have a relative in custody who they suspect could be the killer. However, no charges have been announced. A family friend, Eusebio Byers, said that the night before he spoke with Jonathan, he was at the paint and sit with his girlfriend. They posted on social media having a good time. He was showing everyone, look how much better a painting is than mine. They were both happy, he said. 
Eusebio said that Jonathan worked two jobs, including as a janitor at his son's Bronx school to support the boy and Hanio, and spent all his time and money to ensure they were both happy. The couple split up about a year ago, but had began dating again in recent months to try and patch up their relationship, he added. One neighbour, Paulette Williams said she heard a scuffle then loud thuds and arguing emanating from the first floor on Saturday night at around 11.30pm and then it stopped. Other residents didn't recall anything out of the ordinary. Neighbours told investigators that all three had recently moved into the unit and had mostly kept to themselves. The motive of the attack is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. A 23-year-old man is behind bars for fatally beating his girlfriend. At around 4am on Saturday the 18th of November, authorities responded to Murtis Village Apartments in Jasper, Texas after receiving a 911 call and reports of a disturbance. When officers arrived, they found 24-year-old Roslyn Lewis inside an apartment dead from blunt force trauma injuries. Authorities said that Roslyn's 23-year-old boyfriend William Christian Thomas got into an argument with her before he beat her to death. It's unclear what the argument was about. William was arrested and charged with murder, and is held at the Jasper County Jail with bond set at $1 million. Roslyn was a cheerleading coach and leaves behind three children, aged 2, 3 and 5 years old, who are now in the care of relatives. The investigation into the matter continues. A 57-year-old man has been charged for sexually abusing a young boy. Authorities said that Stephen Gorman abused a juvenile male victim at his home at 2271 Trolley Bridge Road in Quakerville, Pennsylvania. Police said they began investigating Stephen in late October. On the 16th of November, Stephen was arrested and charged with indecent assault on a person younger than 13, corruption of minors, and endangering the welfare of a child. He was released after posting a $500,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A 29-year-old man is behind bars after attacking his stepfather with a claw hammer. At around 3am on Friday the 24th of November, Frankie McNeil walked into his mother and stepfather's bedroom at their home in South Charleston, West Virginia and accused them of trying to kill him. Police said that while his stepfather Stuart Fields lay in bed, Frankie hit him on the left side of his face with a hammer, causing serious injuries. He was then rushed to hospital in a critical condition. Authorities said that Frankie was staying in the house for the Thanksgiving holiday. Frankie was arrested and charged with malicious assault, and is held at the South Central Regional Jail on a $10,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 44-year-old Kelly Boggs is behind bars after she attacked a man with an axe. At around 1am on Friday the 24th of November, the victim was found in a ditch outside the Carter County EMS station's west base along East Tom T. Hall Boulevard in Olive Hill, Kentucky with an injury to his face. The victim was taken to a hospital with serious injuries and Kelly was identified as the attacker. Authorities said that after the attack, Kelly shattered a glass door at the EMS station and entered while EMS workers were inside sleeping. EMS crew held her at gunpoint until officers arrived. Kelly was arrested and booked into the Carter County Detention Centre on charges of assault and criminal mischief. The motive of the attack is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. 35-year-old Cal Clayton Robinson is behind bars for stabbing his 75-year-old father Charles Dwayne Robinson. At 5.36pm on Thursday the 23rd of November, authorities responded to a residence in the 600 block of 33rd Street in Parkersburg, West Virginia on report of an assault. When officers arrived, they found Charles seated inside the home he shared with his son Carl, with multiple stab wounds and lacerations. An officer rendered first aid until medics arrived and transported him to a hospital, where he remains in a stable condition. A witness told officers that the victim's son was believed to still be in the residence. After a brief search, Carl was located and taken into custody without further incident. Carl was booked into the North Central Regional Jail in Doddridge County on a charge of malicious wounding. The motive of the attack is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. 74-year-old James Faulkner Sr. and 33-year-old Amber Taylor are behind bars on multiple drug offences. On Thursday the 16th of November, Craven County deputies stopped a vehicle along Washington Post Road in New Bern, North Carolina for a registration violation. During the stop, 
a police dog alerted deputies to the possible presence of narcotics in the car. While searching the vehicle, deputies located various narcotics and drug paraphernalia. James and Amber were arrested and booked into the Craven County Jail on bonds of $2 million. James evaded and is charged with trafficking heroin, intent to manufacture, sell and deliver controlled substances, along with possession of drug paraphernalia. Amber of New Bern is charged with trafficking heroin and opioids by possession, intent to manufacture, sell and deliver controlled substances, identity theft, possession of drug paraphernalia and resisting an officer. The investigation into the matter continues. A 75-year-old suspect in the Thanksgiving murder has died. On the morning of Thursday, the 23rd of November, authorities responded to a home in the area of Post Street in Inverness, Florida, on report that a possible homicide had taken place. When deputies arrived at the residence, they knocked on the front door and announced themselves. When there was no answer, they began checking the home's perimeter. In the backyard, they saw a large butcher's knife along with blood and drag marks on the ground. Deputies again attempted to make contact with the resident before going inside the house. Upon entry, they found 75-year-old Jonathan Dimmick Sr. sitting in the living room, unresponsive but still alive with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to his stomach. Medics attempted life-saving measures on Jonathan and he was flown by helicopter to hospital, where he later died. Further investigation led deputies to the dismembered body of 67-year-old James Banks, who was found in the trunk of his own vehicle. Authorities said they identified Jonathan as a suspect in James's murder, who then fatally shot himself inside his home. The relationship of both men and the motive in the slaying is unclear. Citrus County Sheriff Mike Prendergast said, The scene our deputies responded to was absolutely shocking. It is rare that a case this horrific occurs in Citrus County, but this is what we prepare for. It is truly unfortunate that our suspect will never be prosecuted for this brutal crime. However, thanks to our coolest courage and our team's quick response, Mr. Banks' family can begin their grieving process with the knowledge that no one will ever suffer again at the hands of Mr. Dimmick. 25-year-old McKinley Sloan Hernandez is behind bars and is accused of injuring a two-year-old toddler in her care. McKinley was taken into custody on Thursday the 23rd of November after a warrant for her arrest was issued for child abuse of a two-year-old boy who was seriously injured in Lakewood, Colorado in September. The boy's mother, Stephanie Reichert, said you never know what would happen to you, especially by someone who you consider a friend. Stephanie said McKinley won't admit to anything. All she said is she was drinking and he got hurt in her care. Stephanie said McKinley regularly watched her son along with others at an unlicensed Lakewood childcare facility at her home. She said McKinley had agreed to watch her son overnight on the 1st of September, but texted her at around 8pm that something had happened. I received a message from McKinley saying I needed to rush to St. Anthony's Hospital because my son had gone lifeless after a bath. Once I saw him and all the 50 doctors standing around, I had to leave the room because it was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life, she said. Stephanie said Giovanni suffered blunt force trauma injuries to his head and body, but she still doesn't know exactly what happened. She said he had to have part of his skull removed because of the swelling and bleeding on his brain. Giovanni's family spent weeks in the hospital and now back at hospital for another surgery. Stephanie says she worries about the lifelong impacts of the injuries on her son as they anticipate a long road to recovery. He doesn't like strangers, she said. Now he doesn't like nurses and doctors. He doesn't let anyone touch him. We have to do everything for them in there. mckinley has been held at the Jefferson County Jail on a $100,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. 42-year-old Edward Kim is behind bars for holding a woman against her will and torturing her at his residence over two days. On Thursday the 16th of November, the woman managed to escape from Edward's apartment located at Craigmont Villas at 4300 North Lamont Street in Las Vegas, Nevada. Authorities responded to the area on numerous reports of finding a woman covered in wounds to her hands, feet and chest. She was taken to University Medical Center with severe traumatic injuries and there told staff that she was beaten with bolt cutters, restrained with zip ties and her hair was set on fire with a torch lighter. Doctors found multiple fractures to the woman's legs, a closed fracture to the nasal bone, contusions to her upper torso, fractures to her fingers, singed hair and signs of sexual assault. Officers returned to the scene after speaking with a the woman. There they found blood on the porch and tried to make contact with Edward. He was later found at a nearby park and officers found he had an outstanding warrant for his arrest on arson charges. 
Edward told officers that he did not know how the woman was injured and told them about sounds he heard in the attic. Eventually, Edward admitted that he and the victim had been messing around and claimed he was not really a criminal. Police recovered bolt cutters, zip ties, and security footage from Edward's apartment. Edward was arrested on numerous kidnapping, sexual assault, battery, and arson charges. He sat at the Clark County Detention Center without bond and is scheduled to appear in court for a preliminary hearing on the 5th of December. The investigation into the matter continues. Fifty-three-year-old Zara Jones is behind bars for fatally stabbing a boyfriend, 69-year-old Michael Willett, and a grandmother, 93-year-old Aramine Mayo. At around 2 p.m. on Saturday, the 25th of November, authorities responded to a home at 7 Fuller Lane in Denmark, Maine, to complete a welfare check on the victims. When police arrived at the home, Zara claimed that Michael was out hunting. Police quickly learned that Michael had a stroke and was wheelchair-bound and was not capable of hunting. Zara refused to let police search the home and told an Oxford County Sheriff's Office sergeant that he was a mongrel and to get down on his knees and pray. Deputies obtained a search warrant and when they entered the premises, they found Michael's body in the bed and Aramine's body was found in the home's entryway. Both victims were stabbed multiple times in the chest. Aramine sustained at least 10 stab wounds, which officials believe occurred before and after her death. Investigators determined that she had been dead for over a day before police found her body. Michael had been stabbed three times, and he'd also been dead for more than a day. Police recovered a blood-covered butcher's knife at the scene near Aramine's body. A family member of Zara told police that Zara and Michael had been living together for years, and that Aramine moved in with them in July of 2023. That family member said that Zara told her that she was tired of taking care of both Michael and Aramine, but she wouldn't let family members help. While police were processing the crime scene, Zara was in the bed near the kitchen acting like she was sleeping, and would not speak to anyone. Zara was taken to Bridgeton Hospital for a mental evaluation due to her erratic behaviour. She was then booked into the Oxford County Jail on two counts of murder, where she remains held without bond. The investigation into the matter continues. On the 16th of November, 26-year-old Emma Jane Hoover was arrested and charged with manslaughter after a two-year-old son accidentally shot himself. At around 3pm on the 24th of October, Emma was driving a white GMC Yukon with her friend 44-year-old Avis Damone Coward who was sitting in the front passenger seat and a two-year-old toddler in the back seat. After pulling into a Sonico gas station at 3000 Dunkel Road in Lansing, Michigan, Avis got out of the vehicle and walked to go into the store. Emma told police that while she and her son remained in the car, her son unbuckled himself from the child seat and crawled into the front seat. Emma said she was playing on her phone when she heard what she described as an explosion. Emma then got out of the vehicle holding her son, who had a gunshot wound to his face. Emma said that when she got out of the SUV, Avis's gun fell onto the ground. She then handed a child to Avis, who then gave him to someone else who took him inside the store and attempted to control the bleeding until medics arrived. He was transported to hospital, but died from his injuries the following night. Surveillance cameras from the gas station showed a small bullet hole that appeared in the front passenger window of the vehicle. As Avis went to close the car door, he bent over to pick up the gun and put it back into the vehicle. He also broke the window that had a bullet hole. He then got into the vehicle and fled the scene. Emma told police that she owned a firearm, but said the gun the boy shot himself with belonged to Avis. Langsing police arrested Avis later that day. They did not find the Yukon he left the scene in earlier. He was charged with being a felon in possession of a firearm, as he had six felonies since 1998 and was prohibited from owning one. Police learnt that there were two firearms in the vehicle, which were later removed and hidden in a barrel in the backyard at a residence owned by Avis. The gun involved in the boy's death was dismantled and sold in pieces. On the 31st of October, police found the GMC Yukon in a field in Lansing heavily damaged by fire. Authorities said that Emma was grossly negligent by either failing to protect her son from unsupervised access to a loaded weapon, or by discharging a gun in close proximity to an unrestrained child while in the vehicle. Following her arrest on the 16th of November, she was arraigned in court on the 20th of November on seven felony counts, including involuntary manslaughter, second-degree child abuse and various weapon charges. Emma was also charged with illegally tampering with an electronic monitoring device that was worn or used as a condition of probation for previous drug convictions. A judge set her bond at $75,000. On Wednesday the 22nd of November, Avis was arraigned on a charge of felony possession of a firearm. Authorities said that additional charges are possible. The investigation into the matter continues. 
A 27-year-old Peston lawn service worker has been arrested twice for exposing himself to two female victims during two separate incidents. Tyler Mountain of Lake Wales, Florida has been charged with lewd exhibition and lewd exhibition to an elderly person. The investigation began on the 26th of October after a 76-year-old woman reported that an employee of Massey Services exposed himself to her while he was in her Devonport, Florida home to provide an estimate for pest control services. The victim reported that Tyler stepped out of the bathroom exposing himself, saying that his zipper was broken, and requested her assistance, which she refused. When a Polk County Sheriff's Office detective contacted Massey Services, a regional manager informed the detective that Tyler's employment with the company had been terminated following the complaint, the second such complaint they received about him. On the 22nd of November, Tyler was arrested for the 26th of October incident. However, the victim in the previous incident in Haines City was not in the county at the time. Upon the woman's return, the detective met with her and learned that Tyler came to her home on the 24th of July for law maintenance, exposed himself, and claimed his zipper was broken. On the 25th of November, Tyler was arrested again and charged with a July offence. Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd said this man used his position to gain access to the homes of these women, and then sexually exposed himself. This behaviour is disgusting and predatory. We believe it's possible that more victims of this man could be out there, and if that's the case, we want them to come forward, he said. The investigation into the matter continues. Thirty-four-year-old Kenneth Bryan is behind bars for stabbing a woman in an unprovoked attack. At 2.05pm on Sunday the 26th of November, authorities responded to a Walgreens parking lot at 1565 Airport Road South in Naples, Florida for a reported battery. Authorities said a woman was heading back to her car when she spotted Kenneth following her out of her peripheral vision. The woman tried to walk faster to get to her car, but before she could get to safety, Kenneth grabbed her and stabbed her twice in the back with a five-inch knife. At the time, the victim initially thought the suspect was punching her. A Walgreens employee who witnessed the attack then called 911 for help. When deputies arrived, Kenneth told them he stabbed a woman. When he asked why he did that, Kenneth stated because I wanted to. The victim survived the attack and was treated at the scene, but deputies said she refused to be taken to a hospital. Investigators found the knife broken in two pieces in the parking lot. It had a serrated edge and a black handle. Brian was arrested and booked into the Collier County Jail and charged with aggravated battery. The investigation into the matter continues. 43-year-old Freddie Wright is behind bars after police found his wife's burned remains inside a metal drum. At 7.57pm on Tuesday the 21st of November, authorities responded to Whitney Mesa Park Trailhead in the 1700 block of Sunset Road in Henderson, Nevada where they located a metal drum ablaze. The fire department extinguished the flames and found the remains of a deceased woman inside. Investigators identified the victim as Janelle Bowen. The coroner's office found evidence that Janelle died of asphyxiation by strangulation and her death was ruled a homicide. Police identified the victim's husband, Freddie Wright, as a suspect. Authorities said that Freddie and his wife, along with their children, had been living in a residence with several other people since mid-November. An individual in the home told police that around the 18th of November, Freddy kicked them out so he could confront his wife. When the person attempted to get back inside, the door was locked. The witness stated seeing what appeared to be Freddy strangling his wife. On the 27th of November, authorities took Freddy into custody. Freddy told detectives that he went to talk to his wife regarding another relationship, and he said he had snapped and strangled her. He then kept her body for several days before he placed her into a metal drum and set the remains on fire at the Whitney Mesa Park Trailhead. Freddie remains held at the Henderson Detention Center without bail on charges of open murder, first degree arson and destroying evidence. The investigation into the matter continues. On the 27th of November 2023, 27-year-old Jesus Medrano III was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for killing his father and stepmother after they stopped him sexually assaulting a teenage girl in 2021. In September of 2023, Jesus pleaded guilty to first-degree intentional homicide with the use of a dangerous weapon and first-degree attempted sexual assault with the use of a dangerous weapon. As part of the plea deal, prosecutors dismissed a second count of intentional homicide and child abuse. At 4.30am on the 6th of January 2021, authorities responded to a home at 91846th Street in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after receiving a call from a girl who said that Jesus choked her. 
When officers arrived, they went inside the home and found blood all over the floor and along the wall, and located two deceased adults in the bedroom with stab wounds. The victims were identified as 49-year-old Jesus Medrano Jr. and 36-year-old Latrice Myers Medrano. Jesus was not at the residence when police arrived, but officers tracked him down to another house sitting on the basement stairs, still holding a machete in his right hand. He was ordered to drop the machete, which he did, before saying just kill me, and he was arrested. Jesus told investigators that he had been having sexual thoughts about the 15-year-old female relative who lived at the house with him for an extended period of time, and he acted upon those thoughts that morning. He said he entered the girl's bedroom and brought a pair of socks with him in case she started to scream. He also brought his large machete into the room in case his dad came in to confront him so he could defend himself. He said as he tried to assault the girl, she fought back so he began to choke her. He said his father then came into the bedroom, so he grabbed the machete and stabbed him to death. Jesus said that Latrice then came into the doorway, so when he jumped over his father to get to her, he accidentally stabbed himself in the thigh. He said that he then fatally stabbed Latrice and ran out of the house. Authorities said that three child relatives fled from the home through a window during the machete attack and sought help from a neighbour who called 911. At his sentencing hearing, Jesus apologised and said, I blame no one but myself for my heinous actions, before being sentenced to life behind bars. 71-year-old Robert McClure was behind bars for fatally stabbing his 61-year-old girlfriend Christine Miller at a senior living facility. At around 9.30am on Tuesday the 21st of November, authorities responded to the River Landing apartment complex at 29 Elm Street in Topsham, Maine on a report of an assault. When officers arrived, they entered an apartment and found Christine deceased with multiple stab wounds. Christine had stab wounds to her hands, arms, upper torso, neck, face, head and shoulders. An autopsy later determined she died of sharp force injuries. Authorities identified Christine's boyfriend Robert as a suspect. A man who works at the complex told police he heard screaming from Christine's apartment at around 9.30am that morning. He said that when he went to the door to investigate, Robert walked out with a knife in his hand. The worker then saw Christine and called 911. He used a cloth and applied pressure to Christine's neck, but by the time first responders arrived, Christine had no pulse and was pronounced dead. A woman who knew the couple told police that Christine and Robert both lived in the complex in separate apartments, and that Christine was trying to get Robert psychiatric help. Neighbours said that Robert had been making statements about witches living there, and threatening to burn the building down. Police found Robert in his apartment with bloodstains on his jacket, and a bloody knife was located in the sink, and he was taken into custody. In an interview with police, Robert said that voices told him that Christine was a witch and that she needed to die. I did stab that lady. Something about this woman was evil, Robert said, adding that he was concerned she may have been trying to poison him. Robert was booked into the Two Bridges Regional Jail on a charge of murder, and has been ordered held without bail. The investigation into the matter continues. Forty-two-year-old Raymond Gerald Calacas is behind bars in connection to the death of his unborn child. Authorities said that on the 11th of November, Raymond assaulted his pregnant ex-girlfriend, 32-year-old Jenny Nicole Hearn, at a home off West North Carolina 152 Highway in Rowan County after an argument quickly turned physical. Days after the assault, the woman went to hospital with concerning symptoms, and the baby was born 24 weeks prematurely. Investigators said Josiah was born on the 14th of November 2023, and lived less than 12 hours before succumbing to injuries from the assault. After his death, an autopsy was completed and the medical examiner determined that Josiah had injuries to his liver, brain, heart, and lungs, and his death was ruled a homicide due to blunt force trauma. On Monday the 27th of November, Raymond was arrested and charged with murder of an unborn child. He's held at the Rowan County Jail without bond. Raymond was previously arrested by deputies on the 17th of November and served with warrants for breaking into Jenny's home. In that incident, Raymond broke into Jenny's home at around 4am on the 14th of November, using a log to break a window. He then entered the residence and began fighting with the man at the house, before breaking more windows on his way out. Raymond then ran into the woods. At that time, Raymond was charged with speeding, two counts of driving while license revoked, having an expired registration tag, operation of a vehicle without insurance, having an expired inspection, first degree burglary, assault, and damage to property. In August, Raymond was arrested in Stanley County for possession of meth and possession of drug paraphernalia. The investigation into the matter continues. 
On the 22nd of November, 50-year-old Shane Allen McMichael was arrested and charged with three counts of sexual exploitation of a minor. Shane, who's a teacher at Lakeview Middle School in Greenville, South Carolina, has since been placed on administrative leave. Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force investigators with the Greenville County Sheriff's Office made the arrest after receiving a cyber tip line report from the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. Investigators said that Shane distributed and possessed files of child sexual abuse material. If convicted, Shane faces up to 30 years behind bars. 44-year-old Sandra Jimenez has been arrested for stabbing a boyfriend in the eye with rabies needles for looking at other women. At just before 10pm on Saturday the 25th of November, Sandra and her boyfriend of 8 years arrived at their home in the 500 block of Northeast 62nd Street in Miami, Florida after spending the night out. Sandra was upset about her boyfriend staring at other women and the pair had been arguing throughout the night. When a man went to lay down on the couch, Sandra jumped on top of him and jabbed him in the right eyelid with two rabies needles that were meant for their dogs. Sandra then left after realising what she had done. The victim called police and was transported to Jackson Memorial Hospital, where he met with detectives. Officers later found Sandra sleeping in a car outside their home, and she was taken into custody. When questioned about the attack, she told police that her boyfriend's injuries were self-inflicted. She was booked into the Turner Guilford Night Correctional Centre and charged with aggravated battery. On Monday the 27th of November, Sandra appeared in bond court where Judge Mindy Glazer set a bond at $7,500 on a condition that she has no contact with her boyfriend. She has since posted bond. Sandra is due back in court for her arraignment on the 26th of December. The investigation into the matter continues. 63-year-old Kerry Burns is behind bars for fatally shooting her sister, 61-year-old Christy Burns. At 4.22am on Tuesday the 28th of November, authorities responded to the 100 block of Hilltop Drive in Kerrville, Texas on reports of shots fired. When deputies arrived, they found Christy unresponsive with a single gunshot wound to her chest. She was transported to the Peterson Regional Medical Center, where she was pronounced dead. Authorities identified Kerry as the suspect, and she was arrested. Kerry's charged with murder, and he's held at the Kerr County Jail on a $30,000 bond. The motive of the shooting is unclear, as the investigation into the matter continues. A 35-year-old woman is behind bars after stabbing a 17-year-old boy. At around midday on Tuesday the 7th of November, authorities received a call about a stabbing that occurred at a residence in the 200 block of Clay Street in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Officers learned that the victim left the scene and was nailed to Hardy's fast food store about half a mile away. Officers located the victim, who had a stab wound to his upper right shoulder. The teen told officers that Amber Leanne Zinnasek stabbed him from behind with a large knife after he turned around to walk away. The victim was taken to a local hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. During the investigation, authorities obtained surveillance footage of the attack and issued a warrant for Amber's arrest. On Monday the 13th of November, Amber was taken into custody. While questioned, Amber said she was defending a family at her own home. The relationship between the victim and the suspect is unclear. Amber's charged with malicious assault and is held at the North Central Regional Jail on a $20,000 bond. If convicted, Amber faces between 2 to 10 years in prison. The investigation into the matter continues. 41-year-old Anthony Wessel is behind bars for killing his 37-year-old wife Anna Wessel. At just before 1pm on Monday the 13th of November, Anthony walked into the Oregon City Police Department and admitted to fatally shooting his wife inside their home at 13417 Squire Drive in Oregon City, Oregon. He described the gun he used in the attack and the location within the house where it occurred. Officers responded to the residence and found Anna deceased inside with two gunshot wounds to the head. The couple had been married for 18 years. There was no one else inside the home at the time of the shooting. The couple's four children aged between 10 to 16 years old have been placed into the custody of their aunt and uncle. Anthony's been charged with second degree murder and unlawful use of a weapon. He remains held at the Clackamas County Jail without bond. The motive of the attack is unclear as the investigation into the matter continues. Two women are behind bars after a four-year-old suffered second and third degree burns over most of her body. At around midday on the 9th of October, 
Authorities responded to a home at 205 Oak Hill Avenue in Seekonk, Massachusetts on report of a four-year-old girl with significant burns over large portions of her body. When first responders arrived, they found a girl in a critical condition and transported to Hasbro Children's Hospital in Providence. Her body was in shock due to burns she suffered and her organs were not functioning properly, which put her at risk of cardiac arrest. The child has since been stabilised but remains hospitalised more than a month after the incident occurred. 44-year-old Francesca Drome told police that she was watching a four-year-old niece on the 8th of October when the girl fell into a fire pit. She told investigators that the girl wasn't in there for very long and that she didn't see any injuries on the child's body. 38-year-old Golene Jerome came home a few hours later and saw blisters all over her daughter's body. The aunt, who has a background in healthcare, assured the mother that the girl was not in any pain. By the following morning, the mother said that the child's skin was falling off, but the aunt insisted that the child was fine. Francesca then gave the child Pedialyte, an electrolyte solution which she threw up. It wasn't until 17 hours after the child was burnt that they called 911. While the girl was being treated at the hospital, she reportedly told a Department of Children and Families worker that Francesca poured boiling water on her. The four-year-old has undergone several skin grafts and other surgeries. On the night of the 11th of November, Francesca and Gailene were arrested. Francesca was charged with mayhem, reckless endangerment of a child, permitting substantial injury to a child, and assault and battery on a child with substantial injury. She's held at the Bristol County Jail without bail. Gailene was charged with reckless endangerment of a child and permitting substantial injury to a child. Her bond's been set at $25,000. Thirty-seven-year-old Shamika Mitchell is behind bars after abandoning her toddler son at a beach in the middle of the night. At midnight on Wednesday the 8th of November, Daytona Beach Police responded to the parking lot of St. Demetrius Greek Orthodox Church at 129 North Halifax Avenue in Daytona Beach, Florida after Shamika's older son, who's a teenager, fought with her after she returned from the beach without a one-year-old son. Police determined that church security allowed Shamika who was from Detroit, Michigan, to stay in the parking lot because she was looking for a safe place for her and her four children to sleep while vacationing in Florida. Police noted that the security employee saw Shamika leave the car with a toddler in her arms, and when Shamika returned without the child, the older sibling questioned her. Shamika said she met the toddler's father at a nearby 7-Eleven and left the child with him. The teen knew this wasn't true because the child's father was in Detroit. Police said that the team began searching for his little brother and calling out his name. After he was unable to find him, he then asked Church's security to call 911. While police spoke with the mother, the team became upset that she abandoned the child. He was arrested after he hit two officers who tried to stop him from lunging at his mother. It's unclear if he's being charged. When police questioned Shamika, she stuck to a story that she left the child with the father, and when asked for proof, she provided the father's telephone number. Police called the father and learnt that he was in Detroit, and authorities launched an immediate search for the one-year-old boy. Shortly thereafter, police were called to the beach at Main Street and Ocean Avenue, where passers-by reported finding a child. The child was identified as Shamika's missing son. A woman said she was walking when she noticed something in the sand, and initially thought it was an animal. As she got closer, she saw it was a child. The woman said the child was on his hands and knees near the water and the waves washed over him, completely submerging him at times. Bystanders got the child out of the water and called 911. The Lucia County Sheriff's deputies patrolling the beach responded to the child's location. Once there, they found bystanders had taken off the toddler's soaked diaper and were trying to warm him up. The temperature that night was 57 degrees Fahrenheit, or roughly 14 degrees Celsius. A deputy put the shivering child in a patrol car and turned on the heater to continue warming the baby up. The child's skin was cold to touch. He was unresponsive and had an elevated pulse and shallow breathing. The deputy continued to help the toddler who started moving his legs once he warmed up, and he was placed into the care of paramedics. Daytona Beach Police said they reviewed surveillance video footage that captured Shamika's movements. Video recording shows Shamika walking on the boardwalk with the child in her arms at 11.57pm on the 7th of November. She's seen walking down the beach access staircase with the baby. At 12.02am on the 8th of November, Shamika is seen coming up the beach access staircase without the child. Then at 12.45am, a sheriff's deputy was notified by dispatchers that a child had been found on the beach at Main Street and Ocean Avenue. The Department of Children and Families took custody of the children as officials awaited the arrival of their grandparents travelling from Michigan. 
Shamika was initially arrested on the 8th of November and charged with unlawful desertion of a child. A judge released her on her own recognizance after she spent a day in the Volusia County Jail. Following further investigation, Shamika was rearrested on the 10th of November on the charge of aggravated child abuse. She's held at the Volusia County Jail on a $50,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are searching for the suspect responsible for fatally shooting 24-year-old Brittany Wicker. At around 6.20pm on Sunday the 12th of November, authorities responded to a home in the 2300 block of South Belmont Avenue in Wichita, Kansas on reports of shots fired. When officers entered the residence, they found Brittany unresponsive with a gunshot wound to her head and she was pronounced dead at the scene. The Wichita Police Department said that Brittany and the suspect were known to each other and the shooting was a result of domestic violence. No suspects have been named and no arrests have been made to date as the investigation into the matter continues. A woman is behind bars for fatally shooting a homeless man. At around 7.20am on Tuesday the 7th of November, authorities responded to the 4200 block of East Fountain Way in Fresno, California and reports of shots fired. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive man laying face down in the parking lot with a gunshot wound to his chest. Medics transported him to Community Regional Medical Centre, where he was pronounced dead about 30 minutes later. The victim was identified as 28-year-old Daniel Payen. Investigators said that after speaking with witnesses and reviewing surveillance footage in the area, they determined that Daniel was unhoused and had a confrontation with another person before he was shot. A suspect, who police later identified as 31-year-old Ted Jerrica Hall, fled on foot after the shooting. On Friday the 10th of November, officers executed a search warrant at Tajerica's residence in Fresno, where she was located and taken into custody. She's charged with murder and remains held at the Alameda County Jail. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are investigating after 27-year-old Tatum Goodwin was found fatally beaten. At around 8.20am on Sunday the 12th of November, authorities responded to the 200 block of Ocean Avenue in Laguna Beach, California, after a construction worker discovered the woman deceased. When officers arrived on scene, they found Tatum's badly beaten body in an alley behind an old movie theatre and Carmelita's, the restaurant where she worked as an assistant manager for four years. On Saturday the 11th of November, Tatum had gone to Hennessy Tavern along Ocean Road with a group of friends after leaving work. And it's also thought that she stopped for a drink at Marine Bar on the opposite side of the street at some point in the evening. Authorities said that Tatum had recently broken up with her boyfriend and appeared to be upset when she left the bar in the early hours. A local resident reported hearing screaming at around 2am that morning, just over six hours before Tatum's body was found. Laguna Beach Police Chief Jeff Calvert said we're saddened by this senseless act of violence. Our detectives are working diligently to bring the suspect or suspects to justice. To date, no suspects have been identified and no arrests have been made as the investigation into the matter continues. On Monday the 13th of November 2023, 43-year-old Dustin Jean Tinklenberg was sentenced to 26 years in prison for murdering his 93-year-old grandmother Stella Anderson with a hatchet in 2022 after earlier pleading guilty to the crime in August of 2023. Dustin had entered a Norgart plea which allowed Dustin to plead guilty while claiming that he could not recall committing the crime because he was under the influence of meth at the time. At just after 12.30pm on the 13th of September 2022, authorities responded to a residence at 1386 Highway 23 in Ogilvie, Minnesota on reports of finding a deceased woman on the couch. Authorities said the body was discovered by her daughter and at least one other family member who placed the 911 call. When officers arrived, they entered the home and found Stella deceased with deep cuts to her face. One of the family members told law enforcement they believed Dustin killed his grandmother. Stella's daughter told police that she went to her mother's home earlier that same day and noticed that the home was unusually dark with the blinds closed. She initially thought her mother was taking a nap when she saw her laying on the couch. The daughter then saw her mother's disfigured face and ran outside to call police. She added that she brought her mother and Dustin to a store a couple of days earlier and everything seemed fine. Two of Stella's great-grandchildren told investigators they went to Stella's home to pick up something from someone camping on the property. While outside the home, one great-grandchild said she heard shouting from inside. Minutes later, she was getting back in her car when she saw Dustin on the deck just outside the house. She said that Dustin seemed upset 
Noting that his fists were clenched and was looking over the deck yelling at something, police found Dustin near the home of a former partner and he was arrested. During an interview with detectives, Dustin said he was constantly being followed by drones and subjected to multiple surgeries which scarred his body, which he didn't even remember happening. Dustin lifted up his shirt to show the scars, however there was no scarring observed. He told investigators that he was homeless, but stayed with his grandmother on occasion. He claimed that he was emotional and accused his grandmother of sexually abusing him when he was a boy, further alleging that she continued to harass him as an adult. When confronted with the news that his grandmother had been killed, Dustin told police that she somehow manipulated and altered the bacon he was eating, and he lost it. Authorities also noted that Dustin was seen on multiple prior occasions with a hatchet-type weapon, including the night before Stella's body was found. Authorities said that Stella died from horrific sharp force injuries that included seven cuts to her head from a tomahawk-type hatchet. Dustin has been held at the Canabit County Jail since his arrest and has been credited with 427 days towards a 26-year sentence for time already served behind bars. Thirty-four-year-old Matthew Ponomarenko will spend the rest of his life behind bars for the fatal beating of his five-year-old son with a baseball bat in 2021. On Thursday the 9th of November 2023, Matthew pleaded guilty to one count of aggravated murder, one count of kidnapping, and one count of endangering children. A judge sentenced Matthew to life in prison with eligibility of parole after 45 years. At around 2pm on Thursday the 25th of March 2021, Matthew called 911 shortly after hitting his son Jax multiple times with a baseball bat at the home at 4707 Russell Avenue in Palmer, Ohio. He told dispatcher that I just killed my son, adding that I was hearing voices. When police responded to the home, they arrested Matthew in the front yard. Authorities found his five-year-old son in the living room with blunt force trauma injuries to his head and face, and was pronounced dead at the scene. Cuyahoga County Prosecutor Michael O'Malley said, Matthew brutally beat and killed his own son. With this sentence, I hope the family can find a modicum of peace and solace. May Jax's memory forever live in their hearts. 36-year-old Shanika Ann McKinsey is behind bars for fatally strangling her 8-year-old son Jason Burgos. On the evening of Tuesday the 14th of November, Shanika brought Jason's unresponsive body to Hialeah Hospital in Hialeah, Florida where he was pronounced dead. A medical examiner's autopsy determined Jason had died by strangulation. Shanika told police she had been planning his son's death for several days and waited for him to fall asleep in the rear passenger seat of her car. She then used a tablecloth to suffocate and strangle him until he stopped breathing. Following his death, Shanika spent several hours driving around various parts of Miami-Dade County, running errands and making DoorDash deliveries with her son's body in the car. Miami-Dade Police Detective Andre Martin said, it's very difficult to wrap your head around how a parent could not only plan to murder their child, but then after carrying out this murder go on about the day as if nothing happened. To drive around with a child's lifeless body and complete various errands as if nothing ever happened, it's unimaginable, he said. On the morning of Thursday the 16th of November, Shanika was arrested and charged with first degree murder. She later appeared in court at 1pm that afternoon and was ordered held without bond at the Turner Guilford Night Correctional Centre. Authorities said that Shanika was homeless and had moved to South Florida last year with her son from Missouri. The child wasn't in school and they're living in different extended stay hotels. Relatives said that Jason's father died a few years ago. The investigation into the matter continues. A 42-year-old man is behind bars for fatally beating his 45-year-old girlfriend. Authorities said that on Monday the 13th of November, Martin Yates beat his girlfriend to death in Detroit, Michigan. Investigators said that he then placed her in his car and drove her body to Gratiot Avenue in Roseville, Michigan, near Interstate 94. At 11.15pm that night, police responded to that location on multiple reports of a disabled vehicle on the side lane, where they found Martin passed out with a fistful of hair and he was covered in blood. They also found his deceased girlfriend's body on the floorboard area of the front passenger seat with severe trauma to her head and face. Police have not released the identity of the female victim. Martin was arrested and charged with second degree murder and is held at the Macomb County Jail without bond. If convicted, Martin faces up to life in prison. Macomb County Prosecutor Peter Lucido said, This is a stark and tragic illustration of the severity of domestic violence. Such crimes are deeply serious and we're committed to ensuring that justice is served. 
A 69-year-old man is behind bars for beating and fatally strangling his 68-year-old wife. At around 2.30am on Monday the 13th of November, authorities responded to the Iredale Memorial Hospital emergency room in Statesville, North Carolina, in reference to an elderly female victim of an assault. At the scene, deputies discovered that Clarence Tyson brought his wife Rebecca Tyson to the hospital. Medical staff attempted life-saving measures on the woman, but she was pronounced dead at the scene. Deputies spoke with Clarence and discovered that a domestic altercation had taken place at their home. Detectives executed a search warrant at the couple's residence at 141 West Aradell Circle and collected evidence and spoke with witnesses. Further investigation revealed that Clarence brutally assaulted his wife at their home and then brought his unresponsive wife to the hospital for emergency treatment. The Chief Medical Examiner's Office completed an autopsy on Tuesday the 14th of November and concluded that Rebecca died of strangulation. She'd also sustained other severe injuries from the assault, including multiple broken bones and bruising. Following the autopsy, Clarence was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He remains held at the Oradale County Jail without bond. Tyson has an extensive criminal history, including past charges of felony larceny by an employee, assault on a female, and driving while impaired. The investigation into the matter continues. 54-year-old David Daniels behind bars for fatally stabbing two tenants and his girlfriend during a dispute about unpaid rent. At around 7.05am on Tuesday the 14th of November, David turned himself into the New York Police at 113th Precinct and said I'm having issues with my tenants. I did something bad. He then calmly confessed that he killed three people and he gave the location and that he left the back door open, recounting the crime in a very matter-of-fact way. Officers then responded to the residence at 12239 Milburn Street in the neighbourhood of St Albans, Queens, New York, where they discovered Daniel's two tenants, a man and a woman, deceased from multiple stab wounds in the basement. They've been identified as 57-year-old Wayne Thomas and 55-year-old Yvette Sweeney. Officers also found Daniel's living girlfriend, 51-year-old Colleen Fields in the second floor bedroom, laying face down on the bed dead with her throat slashed and multiple stab wounds including to her left breast. Queen's District Attorney Melinda Katz described the scene as bloody and was a result of extraordinary brutality and said that Daniel viciously stabbed his defenseless victims to death. Surveillance footage obtained by police showed Daniel leaving the home at around 6.20am that morning, carrying a black garbage bag to his grey 2015 Nissan Murano and driving off. Daniel told police that he'd been having problems with his girlfriend and that the two people in the basement had not been paying their rent. He said that he stabbed the victims because he was upset and under a lot of stress. Daniel's charged with three counts of murder in the first and second degrees and criminal possession of a weapon, and he's held at the Rikers Island Jail without bail. If convicted, Daniel faces life in prison without the possibility of parole. 25-year-old Samantha Lea Brego has been arrested after six of her children were found living in unsanitary conditions. At around 5.30pm on Saturday the 11th of November, authorities responded to multiple reports of unattended children in the parking lot at Tropical Garden Apartments in the 200 block of Ash Street in Brownsville, Texas. When officers arrived, they saw three children, some of whom were completely nude and barefoot, running around the parking lot in the cold rain. Police determined which apartment the children lived and knocked on the door and were greeted by the children's mother, Samantha, who appeared sluggish as if she had just woken up. While officers spoke with her, they detected a strong odour of faeces coming from inside the apartment and saw three other children inside. Police said there was faeces on the walls and couches and the children who were naked and had dry stains of faeces on their faces looked as if they had not showered in a long time. Investigators said that Samantha's six children ranged in age from two to eight years old. Child Protective Services were called to the scene and the children were placed into the custody of their grandmother. Samantha was arrested and charged with six counts of child endangerment. She was booked into the Brownsville City Jail, but was released after posting a $36,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A 48-year-old man is behind bars for abusing his eight-month-old child. On the 26th of September, detectives from the Davidson County Sheriff's Office received a report of abuse against an infant in Denton, North Carolina, and launched an investigation. The baby sustained a brain bleed and three fractured ribs. Medical staff from the Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem determined that the victim's injuries were consistent with inflicted head trauma, also known as shaken baby syndrome. Investigators identified the victim's father, Eddie Dwayne Sims, of 1845 Lofton Road, Denton, as a suspect. On Thursday the 16th of November, 
Eddie was arrested and charged with intentional abuse inflicting serious injury. He's scheduled to appear in court on the 12th of December. The investigation into the matter continues. Williamsburg, Kentucky residents 34-year-old Adam Hayes and his girlfriend 24-year-old Brittany Slaughter are behind bars after investigators found the body of missing 4-year-old Chloe Darnell, whom they cared for and not been seen since September. On Tuesday the 14th of November, the Whitley County Sheriff's Office in Kentucky requested the public's assistance in locating both Brittany and her niece Chloe, who were reported missing from Overlane in Williamsburg and said were likely travelling in a red 2009 Mitsubishi Lancer with a mismatched bumper. On Thursday the 16th of November, investigators located the car and found Brittany in the area later that day. She was listed as unharmed. Chloe, however, remained missing. On Friday the 17th of November, the Whitley County Sheriff's Office announced that they found Chloe's body in a shallow grave around Rodner Cemetery in Corbin and that Brittany and Adam had been arrested. Chloe's body was reportedly originally buried in the yard of their house before being moved roughly five miles away to the cemetery where authorities found her remains. Family members of Chloe said that every time they would ask Brittany where Chloe was, she would come up with excuses as to why Chloe could not see them. The last time they saw her was in late September. Brittany and Adam had been charged with murder, abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence. Adam was additionally charged with possession of a firearm, possession of marijuana and trafficking in heroin. They've both been held at the Whitley County Detention Centre. Brittany's bond's been set at $1.5 million and Adam's has been set at $1,605,000. The investigation into the matter continues. A teenager is behind bars for fatally shooting his mother. At 12.36pm on Monday the 20th of November, authorities responded to a home at 2279 Warren Street in Toledo, Ohio on reports of a person shot. When officers arrived, they entered the premises and found a woman in a critical condition with a gunshot wound. She was transported to a local hospital where she was pronounced dead. The woman was identified as 53-year-old Deborah Baker. Authorities identified Deborah's 18-year-old son Joshua Brown, who lives with his mother as a suspect in the shooting. While questioned, Joshua admitted to shooting his mother. He told investigators that he heard someone coming up the stairs, which scared him. He grabbed a handgun he had on his lap, walked out into the hallway and shot once, striking and killing his mother. He was arrested and charged with reckless homicide, and is held at Lucas County Correction Center. Four years ago, Toledo police posted on social media about Joshua when he was 14, after he went missing from his home on Warren Street and was later found. The post described him as being high-functioning autistic and having attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. On the 12th of May 2022, when Joshua was 17, he was walking near Putnam Street and Columbia Street at 4pm, when multiple shots were fired from an unknown SUV that drove by, police said at the time. He suffered one gunshot wound and was treated at Mercy Health St. Vincent Medical Center. Police did not identify any suspects in that case. The investigation into the matter continues. 27-year-old Kayla Michael Scott of Shreveport, Louisiana is accused of trying to rape his grandmother. On the evening of Saturday the 18th of November, Kayla entered a room while masturbating then tried to force himself on her. At 10.05 p.m. that night, Kaylin was arrested and charged with attempted first-degree rape. Kaylin admitted to all the acts and stated that he's attracted to older women. He remains held at the Shreveport City Jail. A 25-year-old man is behind bars for multiple child sex offences. On the 16th of October, the Special Victims Unit at the Alamance County Sheriff's Office in North Carolina began to investigate a reported sexual assault of a minor. During the investigation, detectives identified Eric Maldonado Cardenas of Burlington as a suspect. On Thursday the 16th of November, Eric was arrested and charged with sex offence with a child by an adult, indecent liberties with a child, and rape of a child by an adult. Eric remains held at the Elements County Jail on a $250,000 bond. On Friday the 17th of November, 42-year-old Joshua Daniel Quesenberry and 43-year-old Julie Diane Quesenberry of Ripley, West Virginia were arrested following a child neglect complaint. Investigators interviewed the couple's four children, who said that their parents threatened them and each other with guns on multiple occasions. Joshua and Julie have been charged with child neglect creating a risk of serious injury or death. They each held at the South Central Regional Jail on a $100,000 bond. 
A 30-year-old man is behind bars for shooting his girlfriend. At around 1.30am on Sunday the 19th of November, authorities responded to an apartment complex in the 1000 block of College Drive in Texarkana, Texas and found a 25-year-old woman suffering from a gunshot wound to the shoulder. She told police that her boyfriend, Gavante Wright, shot her in another apartment and she ran to a neighbor's apartment looking for help. Medics transported the victim to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The Texarkana police said that while Lieutenant Jeremy Courtney was responding to the call, he noticed a man getting into a vehicle along College Drive leaving the scene. He stopped the car a little over a mile away along St. Michael Drive and found that Cavante was a passenger. Cavante was taken into custody after other officers arrived at that location. He initially resisted their efforts to handcuff him, but he eventually complied. During this encounter, the officers could see a pistol laying on the floorboard under Cavante's feet. Cavante was arrested and charged with aggravated assault causing serious bodily injury and resisting arrest. He's held at the Bi State Jail with bond set at $120,000. The investigation into the matter continues. A Fulton County Detention Officer is accused of behaving inappropriately with a male inmate at the South Annex Jail in Union City, Georgia. On the night of Thursday, the 16th of November, 37 year old Latasha Baker was arrested and charged with three counts of possession of prohibited items by inmate and three counts of violation of oath of office. She was fired from her job the next day. Authorities said a second person, identified as 20-year-old Jaheem Arnold, was also arrested in connection to the contraband investigation. Jaheem was charged with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, possession of a firearm or knife during the commission of or attempt to commit certain crimes, willful obstruction of law enforcement officers and several traffic violations. Authorities said Latasha was first employed as a detention centre officer with the Sheriff's Office from the 10th of February 2016 to the 12th of January 2022. She was rehired on the 7th of June 2023. Latasha and Jahima held at the Fulton County Jail without bond. Fulton County Sheriff Patrick Labbitt said, I'm committed to holding each and every employee accountable to the oath they've taken to protect and serve our community. The actions of this one officer are certainly not a reflection of the rest of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. The introduction of contraband to any of our facilities would not be tolerated, he said. The investigation into the matter continues. 25-year-old Deng David Kerr is behind bars for fatally stabbing an elderly woman and injuring her daughter. At around 11.30pm on Saturday the 18th of November, authorities responded to a home at Ulandi Court in the Beckenham neighbourhood of Perth in Western Australia after receiving a report of an altercation involving multiple parties. When officers arrived, they found a woman deceased inside the residence with a stab wound and she was identified as 63-year-old Julianne Egan. They also located Julianne's daughter, 30-year-old Emma Egan with multiple stab wounds. She was transported to the Royal Perth Hospital in a critical but stable condition. Witnesses reported seeing Deng leave the premises shortly after the altercation was reported. Police said Deng was known to the victims and was out on bail for public order offences. Police searched the area for Deng and at around midday on Sunday the 19th of November, he was located less than a mile away from the crime scene and he was arrested. He's charged with murder and attempted murder and Bond has been denied. The investigation into the matter continues. A 71-year-old nursing home resident is behind bars after fatally beating his neighbour during a fight over the washing machine. At 9.25pm on Friday the 17th of November, authorities responded to Salem Village Nursing and Rehabilitation at 1314 Rail Avenue in Jolliet, Illinois, on reports of an assault on the sixth floor. When officers arrived, they found an unresponsive 61-year-old man in the laundry room. Facility staff provided medical assistance to the victim until paramedics arrived. During the investigation, authorities learned that William Paschal attacked the victim while in the laundry room after becoming angry about the victim's use of the washing machine. A staff member tried to intervene, and William repeatedly punched the victim in the head and used the victim's walker in the attack, causing the victim to fall to the floor. Despite medics attempting life-saving measures, the victim died at the scene. William was arrested and booked into the Will County Jail on charges of first-degree murder and aggravated battery. The investigation into the matter continues. Police are searching for two suspects involved in the fatal shooting of a man at a gas station. At 10.31pm on Wednesday the 15th of November, 
Authorities responded to the Chevron gas station at 2111 Campbellton Road Southwest. In Atlanta, Georgia, on reports of a shooting, when officers arrived, they found an unresponsive man laying in the parking lot with multiple gunshot wounds. Medics pronounced him dead at the scene. The victim was identified as Jatovius Favors. Investigators learned that Jatovius made a purchase in the store while his two children sat in the car. CCTV captured two other men get into a dispute with Jatovius inside the store. The altercation escalated as the men went outside, and the suspects gunned Jatovius down in front of his kids. Police said they're looking for the two suspects who fled the scene in a blue Jeep Compass. The investigation into the matter continues. Religious leader 26-year-old Hans Schmidt was shot in the head for preaching to people in the streets. The incident occurred at around 6pm on Wednesday the 15th of November on the northwest corner of 51st and Peora Avenues in Glendale, Arizona. Hans, who's a former military combat medic, was on the megaphone on the street corner, preaching to people passing by when someone pulled out a gun and shot him in the head. No one heard the shot or saw where it came from. The bullet entered his left temple and travelled through his brain and became lodged on the right side of his head. Police reviewed surveillance footage at the intersection, which showed Hans fall before getting up, walking and talking as he bled profusely. No one realised what happened at first, until he began vomiting and having seizures, and he was rushed to hospital. He was sedated and had fluid drained from his head to relieve pressure on his brain, and he was placed on life support. Police are still trying to identify a suspect, and it remains unclear if Hans was shot by someone inside a vehicle, or someone passing by on foot. Hans is married and a father of two small children. His wife Zula is asking anyone with information to come forward, while praying for the safe recovery of her beloved husband. The investigation into the matter continues. 33-year-old Mitchell L. Dorsalus is behind bars for sexually assaulting a woman multiple times. On Thursday the 16th of November, the victim told investigators at the Alachua County Sheriff's Office in Gainesville, Florida, that at the end of May, she became stranded at a gas station and accepted a ride home from Mitchell L., as they both lived in the same apartment complex. When they arrived at a residence, Mitchell L. reportedly asked if he could come inside, and the victim agreed. She said that he and Mitchell L. talked for a while, but then he began talking about sexual topics. When she said she wasn't interested in having a sexual relationship with him, he became aggressive and started groping her and pulled her into a room. He then threw her face down on her bed after a struggle. The victim said he overpowered her, undressed her and raped her. She said she told Mitchell L. multiple times to stop, but he continued the assault. She said he told her after the rape that no one would believe her if she reported it, because she was overweight. The victim said that Mitchell has come to her residence unannounced six or seven times since the first incident, and demanded that she let him inside. She said he made her afraid that she would be harmed if she did not let him in. In early November, she said he coerced her into letting him in, and said he wanted to teach her self-defense. She said he told him she didn't want to do that, but he pinned her to the ground and digitally penetrated her. She said he kept telling him to stop, and he finally left. The victim identified Mitchell Allen in a photo lineup, and said she was still afraid he would harm her. On Friday the 17th of November, Mitchell Allen was arrested and charged with two counts of sexual assault, two charges of sexual assault with battery, and one charge of stalking and threatening. He is held at the Alachua County Jail on a $1,350,000 bond. The investigation into the matter continues. A mother and two babysitters are behind bars after three children were horrifically abused in Marion County. On Tuesday the 7th of November, authorities responded to the United Hospital Centre in Bridgeport, West Virginia, after staff called them advising that three children aged three, four and six years old had been brought in with severe injuries. Once on scene, investigators say hospital staff told them that the children suffered internal bleeding on their heads and faces and had pressure wounds on their buttocks that indicated they were forced to stay in the same position for an unnecessary period of time. Authorities said it was apparent that their children had been severely beaten, based upon the multitude of bruises on their faces, arms, backs, legs and chests. The three-year-old had been struck severely in the head, resulting in the whites of his eyes to pull blood. Two of their children identified 50-year-old Michael Stemple as her abuser. Investigators spoke with the children's mother, 27-year-old Crystal Ridener, who told them that Michael and his wife, 45-year-old Linda Semple, had been babysitting them while she was at work. She said she found out that Michael was hitting the children about two weeks prior, and had spoken with Michael and Linda about hitting the children. She said that on Sunday the 5th of November, 
She saw that the children had been beaten again and that Michael threatened to kill her and her children if she notified police. Michael was arrested on the 7th of November and charged with three counts of abuse resulting in injury and is held at the North Central Regional Jail on a $150,012 bond. On Friday the 17th of November, Crystal and Linda were also arrested. Investigators said that Linda was an active participant and witness of the abuse and torture of the children and that Crystal was also present and witnessed the abuse of the three children and never attempted to stop or report the abuse. Linda and Crystal were charged with three counts of abuse resulting in injury with Crystal being additionally charged with child neglect causing injury. Linda's bond is $200,512 and Crystal's set at $225,000. They all remain held at the North Central Regional Jail. The investigation into the matter continues. A US Army officer's spouse at the military base at Fort Eisenhower, Georgia, has been charged with murder and the death of her infant son. 30-year-old April Evelyn Short was also charged with an aggravated circumstance of murder taking place during an act of child abuse. On the morning of Wednesday, the 15th of November, April used a knife to cut the neck of her 11-month-old child. He was later pronounced dead at the Eisenhower Army Medical Center. Investigators said that April texted her husband, Sergeant James Short, at around 8 a.m. that morning while he was at work, referencing God and that the days of darkness were upon them and that she and her husband would be together again. He tried calling his wife but was unsuccessful. At around 8.15am, he went to his post home at 803A Apple Court and found his wife barricaded in the master bedroom with the couple's three children. He couldn't get in, and at 9am he called 911. Three officers arrived on scene about five minutes later and convinced April to exit the bedroom, but she then tried to flee the scene in a vehicle with two of her children, but was stopped when an officer drew his gun. At 9.11am, her husband searched for the third child and found the baby in the bathroom, wrapped in a shower curtain bleeding from the neck. The infant was rushed to hospital located just over a mile away, where he was pronounced dead at 9.34am. When questioned by investigators, April said she knew she had done something wrong and evil. She said that before officers were called to the scene, she had two knives and was cutting the baby so he could be with Jesus and God, and she threatened to stab one of the other children if they did not stop crying. While her two other children were in the bedroom, she yelled at them, don't come into the bathroom because it might be really scary. She admitted barricading the door of the master bedroom, wrapping the baby in a shower curtain in the bathtub, and trying to use a knife to cut his neck. She also said that the first knife she tried to use didn't work because it was dull, so she used the second knife. April appeared for initial court hearing, but she did not enter a plea. The court ordered her to submit to a psychiatric evaluation. She's currently in the custody of U.S. Marshals and he's been held at the Jefferson County Detention Center to wait further proceedings. The investigation into the matter continues. <laughs>